Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. A new book was recently released about the carnivore diet, and while we don't review the book itself, we do provide a really nice review of the book's cover in today's episode. We also review a documentary called The Game Changers. This is a new documentary about plant-based diets that has caused a lot of strong opinions in the fitness industry, and we have some opinions of our own. On the training side of things, Greg has a research roundup segment for us, and in that segment he reviews three recent studies about foam rolling, the relationship between capillary density and muscle growth, and finally the relationship between resistance training and your risk of death. Finally, we've got an excellent interview with Michael Hull from examine.com, and he tells us everything we could possibly want to know about ketogenic diets. As always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler, and today we've got a treat, a special temporary guest host named Greg Knuckles. Hey, th- thanks for inviting me on. This is an honor and a privilege. I'm sure you're going to do a great job. Um, before we get into our feats of strength, um, got a little segment here. Is th- is this a read of the week, do you think, Greg? <laughs> that seems strong. I, I, I would say it's... A- it's a recommended against read of the week, if that <laughs> if that's a thing. Yeah. So, um, Greg brought this to my attention the other day, and <laughs> hard as I try, I just can't get it out of my mind. It's um, the it's the single greatest piece of graphic design in human history. Yeah. So the book recently got released. Uh, it was called "Our Carnivore Diet: How to Cure Depression and Disease with Meat Only," and. Uh, on the book's cover and in the uh, the Amazon uh, link for the book, the, the two authors are listed as Jordan and Michaela Peterson. Jordan's listed as first author there. Yeah. I just noticed that. Well, I, my eyes were so... By, by extension, Michaela is listed as senior author. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I hadn't even gotten to, to the, the author line because my eyes were <laughs> focused elsewhere. So... Turns out they, <laughs> after this came out, people were talking about it. They said, nope, that that is not us. It turns out somebody basically just compiled a bunch of their transcripts and blog posts and stuff, stapled it together, threw a cover on it and said, hey, here's a book from them and just started selling it. So Amazon uh, eventually did take the book down. So you can, last I checked, you can no longer buy it on Amazon because it incorrectly uh, attributed authorship to Jordan and Michaela Peterson. They, they wrote all the content in it, but they did not put it together. They did not come up with the title and they did not uh, sell it. Or unfortunately, they are not able to take credit for the incredible cover art that is really a huge step forward for graphic design. I'm going to do my best to describe this. And then Greg, you go ahead and jump in and catch anything I missed. So they are on a beach. Um. Michaela is inexplicably magnified <laughs> two to threefold larger than, than Jordan. Um, but they appear to both be on the same beach. It's not like uh, it's not like it's two separate images. I mean, and so M- Michaela's no, where... no. So, I mean, it is clearly photoshopped because you can look at the way that the light is hitting both of them and it's quite different. Like, so it's right. coming slightly from Michaela's right and Jordan's left, which is impossible given how they're standing yes absolutely that is clearly photoshop but what what i'm suggesting is it seems like the attempt was to make it look like they were on the same beach like in the same image and the perspectives and the sizing and the shadows they're just it's it's just absolute chaos michaela looks like she's on a beach you know she's wearing a bikini uh jordan is wearing a a colorful beach towel (laughs) and looking down and uh there's just a lot going on in the image, and it's worth noting that for some reason they chose the font that is essentially exclusively reserved for like thriller, like murder mystery novels. So I, I think they used three different fonts on the title, uh, <laughs> which I didn't even notice that. Which I don't think is is typographical best practice. <laughs> um, oh man, and. Uh, Jordan very hypocritically is not standing up straight with his shoulders back, which uh, is just abominable to me. 
Yeah, I, that's rule number one, right? I think so. Yeah. So, so me being a you know a bit of a nutrition buff myself, I was curious as to the subtitle, which is how to cure depression and disease with meat only. Um, now that's a big claim. I'm going to be completely transparent. I have not yet read the book. Um, I'm sure there's sufficient evidence within there, uh, to justify the claim. Well, c- calling it a book is a bit of a stretch, right? Isn't it just like a collection of curated blog posts? Yeah, but it's bound together. Sure. <laughs> so we're going to, I'm going to call that a book. Um, now what kind of evidence would you need to, uh, justify such a huge claim? I would like to see documentation of how fast your children are. That <laughs> If you were to, if you were to give me confirmed, and and you can't do like a handheld stopwatch. I want late confirmed, electronically timed one hundred meter and two hundred meter data. Um, if you don't, if if you don't know what we're talking about right now, just uh, just ask Lane Norton about his his Twitter spat with Michaela Peterson and how she suggested they settle it. Yeah, so basically in their discussion of whether or not the carnivore diet was the one and only true diet, she said, let's do this the most rigorous way we can think. Our children should race. And if my <laughs> if my carnivore children are faster than your omnivore children then I believe we know all we need to know. So I'm, again, I I haven't read it. I am not making a claim about what's between those covers, but I assume there are volumes uh, of longitudinal uh, running times. (laughs) And I think that would be sufficient evidence. Okay, so Greg, (laughs) let's rapidly move on to anything else that exists, such as feats of strength. All righty, so... Starting with two somewhat unconventional feats, more just feats of athletic performance. Um, So as I'm sure most of you know, but some of you may not know if you're just only focused on the strength world, both uh, marathon world records recently fell. So uh, Elliot Kipchoge ran one hour, 59 minutes, 40 seconds. Uh, That's not an official world record because it wasn't done in an open race. Uh, he had people handing him water instead of having to like go to a table and grab water. Like th- there's some, there are a lot of people trying to discredit it, but I mean, he ran 26.2 miles in under two hours, which is absolutely outrageous. And I think a lot of the the arguments people are putting forth against it, at least to my ears, come across as like pretty facile. So, you know, they say, oh, he's wearing better shoes. It's like, dude, technology has improved in every sport in existence. Um, Usain Bolt wasn't running with spikes on a cinder track the same way Jesse Owens was. Uh, So, I mean, yeah, technology's gotten better. Still, no one else has run that in two hours. Uh, He had pacers, which helped break the wind for him, um, which isn't... So that's not a strategy used in marathon all that often, but like it could be. That's something that's done in uh, road cycling all the time. So people are like, oh, he had pacers, uh, you know, people to break the wind for him. Whatever. He still ran a marathon in under two hours. Uh, I figure at some point we'll see someone do it in a normal sanctioned race. As far as I see it, he's the one that broke the barrier. Uh, one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. Um, so that happened. And then... Yeah, I mean, I I was at a uh, presentation by Andrew Jones a while back. He's a big-time cardiovascular guy. He's done a lot of beetroot juice research over in the UK. And he was in charge of Nike's Breaking 2 project. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, it was a big project funded by Nike to try to make, make it happen, the first sub-two-hour marathon. And his presentation was about all of the nuance and intricacies of what their approach was, uh, the calculations they used about oxygen transport and Mm -hmm. exercise efficiency to see if it was even doable, uh, if they could even make the numbers work realistically. 
Um, and w I saw that presentation very shortly, I believe, after the failed attempt. And to see it happen like this, you know, I'm one of those people who I'm not an endurance uh, endurance running purist by any means. Um, obviously, it'll be a, it'll be cool to see it done under more typical racing conditions in like a sanctioned uh, marathon event. But in any case, it's just wildly fascinating and very, very, very cool. No, for sure. And I mean, the the thing about Kipchoge is he's obviously an incredible athlete. Uh, I think pretty much indisputably the best marathon runner ever. I think something a lot of people don't realize is he could have potentially been even better. So Kipchoge is 34. Um distance like long distance athletes tend to age better than strength athletes do so for example if you're a weightlifter and you're 30 typically you are considerably over the hill by that point um so it's not as steep of a fall off for endurance athletes but they do still tend to be their best kind of in the neighborhood of 30 years old so like 34, you wouldn't expect a big drop off. But that is still slightly over the hill by marathoners um, standards, I guess. And so a thing to note about Kipchoge is, you know, he's incredible, uh, has the fastest marathon time in a sanctioned race as well, like 201.38, give or take. Um, but he didn't turn to marathon running until I believe 2013, give or take. Um, so prior to that, he ran the 5k and the 10k and was good, but not like, you know, not like runaway best in the world. And so he switched to half marathons in 2012 when, uh, it's 2019. So he would have been 27 already. Um, and then switched to marathons in 2013. So, I mean, obviously like there's going to be carryover from being a elite 10k runner to being a half marathon and marathon runner, but it's not like this is something he's trained for his entire life. If, if he started chipping away at the marathon record when he was 18, who knows what he could have run when he was like 28, if that's when he was peaking in the marathon instead of just getting into the sport. So absolutely incredible athlete. And, you know, one of these days there's going to come someone else who is just as talented as him. Uh, and, you know, we'll do it in a race or who knows, he may, he may do it in a sanctioned marathon as well. Uh, sure. Can I share an interesting marathon story very briefly? Sure. Someone I know used to compete at the collegiate level in marathons, and they were telling me a really funny story about one particular marathon that they ran back in the day. The national meet was held out in the American Southwest. And... <laughs> So, so this person was like, they had to do it really early, right? To, to try to beat the heat um, and make sure that people weren't going to just like die from heat exhaustion. So they did it early and apparently they, they timed it at a time that coincides with all the snakes like oh, coming, no. coming out, of, out of their holes. Oh God. And so like one of the main challenges was like, can you avoid the snakes on the route while trying to run this marathon at nationals? So. <laughs> very intense sport especially when there are snakes everywhere that's wild uh so the the other marathon related thing for for the five listeners who've made it marathon this far, by science yeah. uh, <laughs> so for for the five people who've, who've made it this far into the episode um there was actually another marathon record broken pretty recently which unfortunately got overshadowed but which i think is is almost as impressive given the record that it beat so uh bridget koskai ran 21404 breaking the the female marathon record um so note about that the previous record was by paula radcliffe which was 21525 set all the way back in 2003. So this was a 16-year-old record still on the books. Um, there were some people who had gotten kind of close to it, but not within like a handful of seconds, I don't think. I, I think there was still kind of like a 15, 30-second cushion between that record and, and the next best. And so one, you know, breaking a 16-year-old record is always super impressive. But then two, she beat it by over a minute, uh, taking it down from 215.25 to 214.04. So, and, and that was, 
I, I believe that was in a sanctioned event as well. So, I mean, Kipchoge's incredible, and he deserves all of the praise he gets for the sub too. Um, but I, I, I think not enough. I think that overshadowed uh, Kaskai's world record, which, uh, you know, was done in a, a standard meet. I'm pretty sure it may not have been, but I think it was. Um, but you know, wiping a 16 year old record off the books and doing it by over a minute, that is also incredibly impressive. Uh, and I feel like she, she deserved more attention than she got. One final note, not about marathon so much, but just track and field in general is it may surprise you to hear that someone's breaking a 16 year old record because there is the perception that like, Every sport is improving all the time, and people are constantly setting records. Uh, I recently posted a video to my Facebook page of uh, Lasha hitting the heaviest clean and jerk ever caught on camera, and a couple people in the comments were like, dude, like, total has only improved like eight kilos since the 1980s. Like, that's kind of sad, bro. And it's like, one, like, testing was completely different back then. Uh, insofar as until WADA formed in like 99, the Olympics were essentially untested, not completely, but like not anywhere close to what is going on today. So, you know, any improvement at all in the super heavyweight weightlifting record in a sport that is obviously very strongly influenced by drugs, like sure, people are still on, but they... They at least have to be drug-free on the platform when they give that urine sample, which very much did not used to be the case. So one, that's impressive in its own right. And then two, the assumption that there's, you know, tremendous amounts of progress being made in every sport, that's just not the case. Um, so during that conversation, I went through and just checked Wikipedia to see uh, what track and field records were on the books and when were they set. And between both men and women's competition, there's something like 30, 31 records from the 90s or before still on the books. Um, a lot of them in like power sports, so like throwing and whatnot, or like shorter distance races. Um, largely because like with with changes in drug testing, um, it's it's made it in some sports very difficult for modern day athletes to compete with records that were set uh, under a very different anti-doping regimen, which I feel one, uh, I think that that makes new world records more impressive uh, to a degree that I think a lot of people don't quite fully realize, you know, because if you go into it with the assumption that, oh, records in every sport are falling all the time, it is impressive, but you kind of expect it to happen. Um, that's really not the case. Like, people currently setting records in a lot of these sports, again, are probably using, but can't get away with using as much as people used to be able to. So when they do break those old records, I feel like that makes it even more impressive. Um, and yeah, just... You know, I, f I f felt like I was going to say two things about that, and then only one came to mind. But yeah, uh, really sports aren't progressing, a, a lot of them, at the rate I think a lot of people perceive. Uh, and, and so Bridget Koskai wiping out a 16-year-old record, incredibly impressive, um, but also shouldn't be taken as that surprising because there's a lot more 16-year-old records on the books than I think a lot of people realize. Sounds good. Any, uh, any non-marathon related feats of strength this week? Yes, so actual feats of strength. Uh, Whoa, so, easy. Well, I mean, I wouldn't consider a marathon a feat of strength. I, I said on the front end, a feat of athletic performance. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so USAPL Nationals were were pretty, pretty recent. Um, I kind of expected that I'd have a lot more uh, world records from Nationals to discuss. But... Uh, Yes, yeah, seemed like seemed like in a lot of weight classes, just kind of a pretty rough competition all around. Um, some people came in not quite at their best, dealing with illnesses or injuries. Uh, I think judging was quite strict, which which made it more of a challenge for some lifters. Um, but there were still several records set and quite a few notable performances. 
So uh, first off, got to give a shout out to my boy Bryce Lewis. Uh, totaled 1989.6 pounds or 902.5 kilos at 105. That uh, breaks Weir Bicky's world record in the 105 kilo class, um, which is awesome. I, I think Bryce has previously held that record before, but for a while, uh, Weir Bicky was kind of looking uh, untouchable there for a little bit. Um, and so, and, and Bryce. Bryce, I think prior to this, had his best total in 2017 and then was still really, really good through 2018, but kind of not rising to his old peaks. Um, And so, like, you know, obviously a super competitive lifter, but honestly, this total surprised me a little bit. Um, So this was this was awesome to see. Bryce is a great dude. Uh, Glad he took the record back. Uh, so next, uh, another world record from Samantha Calhoun. She totaled uh, 1,126.5 pounds or 511 kilos in the 63 kilo class. Um, so world record, obviously very, very impressive. Um, she's been making considerable progress over the last few years, and I only see her stranglehold on that class continuing. Um and then a very, very noteworthy performance. This, this I think, was my favorite story out of Nationals. Uh, so if you've been following just like lifting Facebook or lifting Instagram for the past year or so, you have probably seen Mahalia Reeves, even if you don't like even if you don't know the name, you've probably seen videos of her. So she's a 15 year old girl. Uh, the first video of her that kind of went viral, I think she was benching 330. Um, and since then, she's competed in a few meets, put up either 365 or 370 on the platform in the bench press. Again, it's a 15 year old girl, um, which, you know, blew minds. And so she qualified for nationals, um, still lost to Banika Brown because everyone loses to Banika Brown because she's a monster. Um, but she, she tied for second in the total lost on body weight. So she got a bronze medal, but tied for second place on the total, uh, with, uh, 1350.3, um, pounds. I forgot to get the kilos for that, but that's a little over 600 kilos, I believe. Um, but that, so it was the second best at nationals and it's tied for the third best, uh, drug-free female total of all time, which is wild. Because, again, uh, let me reiterate, she's 15 years old. Um, so everyone knew she had a huge bench. She's posted a bunch of videos of that. Uh, people have seen it on the platform before. I was pretty surprised with the squat. So she's posted squat videos, and a lot of so the ones I had seen were... Uh, box squats that looked to my eye a bit high. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, what's it going to be when she actually has to sink it and take the box away? She still squatted something like 525 or 540 or something like that, uh, which is outrageous. And uh, she also deadlifted 440. So that's just wild. She's incredibly strong. Her future in the sport is super bright. Uh, definitely a rising star, uh, in the USAPL and just powerlifting in general. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how old Benika is, but one, if she ever decides to retire from competition, it, it looks like the future of, of the American super heavyweight women is, is pretty safe. Um, and then last but not least, uh, gotta give a shout out to Jamar Royster, We've talked about him on the podcast before. I said he was uh, gearing up for a big squat at Nationals. I don't know that he got quite as much as he wanted to get. He squatted 305 kilos, which is two, which is 672. Um, so that ties him for the second biggest squatter in that weight class of all time. Uh, and his total moved him into the top 10 of all time in the 83 kilo class. So um, I don't think he hit quite the numbers he had in mind, but still had a very good meet, PR total, top 10 of all time. Uh, So congrats to Jamar. 
Okay, before we move on, there's one more feat of strength that must be mentioned. So feats of strength, we've uh, previously talked about American football players on one occasion when we uh, we acknowledged Wisconsin's offensive line. Um, they came off a great game and they deserved it. But this weekend, Ohio State faced that very same offensive line. Ohio State has a defensive lineman named Chase Young, and he was an absolute problem. Uh, Chase Young had six tackles, five for a loss. He had four sacks, forced two fumbles, and I believe both of those fumbles turned into touchdowns going the other way. Um, So Chase Young, if you watch the game, stats aside, he was just a genuine nightmare for everyone involved. Even the plays he didn't make the tackle, he was just everywhere all at once. Absolutely incredible. I mean, he's the most dominant defensive player in college football since uh, Indomitian Sue back back in his uh, should have been Heisman season. Yeah, and so that, that's where a lot of people went with it. Right after this game, people said, Chase Young, you have to put him on the Heisman shortlist. Defensive players usually don't get a lot of love in recent years for the Heisman, so we'll see we'll see where that goes. But in any case, he was an absolute problem. Just absolutely insane athleticism, and uh, keep an eye out for him in coming weeks. Very fun to watch. Okay, so for the next segment, um, I don't know if we have a name for this one. It's uh, Media Review. Media Review. uh, Contemporary Cinema. (laughs) So Views of the Week. Exactly, yeah. So at, at least a couple listeners... Uh, there's a new documentary out. It's called The Game Changers. And at least a few visit, uh, listeners messaged me and said, hey, you should listen to this and then talk about it on the podcast. Um, and I wouldn't possibly put Greg through that. I, I did not ask him to view it. But I went ahead and fell on the sword and watched it myself. And I've got some opinions. Now, let me state my biases on the front end. I'm an omnivore. And normally when someone does something nutritionally that I think is potentially ill-advised or unnecessary, I usually just mind my own business. I I don't particularly care. But it's when you or when they begin to start telling other people how they should be eating or even worse, start masquerading as some type of uh, distributor of science that, that's when I start to take a closer look at it and, and in some cases get a little bit annoyed. So the Game Changers documentary, it's basically, uh, it's like a very pro-plant-based kind of pro-vegetarian, pro-vegan type documentary. And it follows uh, the, the main protagonist who's uh, basically like uh, an MMA fighter who, who is like also like a self-defense instru- instructor has a knee injury, starts reading a bunch of research, and comes across this paper indicating that gladiators had high bone mineral density and probably mostly ate plants. So you would think that you're laid up and the years, I don't know when it was filmed, 2017, 2018, you'd think you'd be looking at the contemporary nutrition literature for nutrition guidance, but instead we went to the archaeology literature and went right to the uh, Roman gladiator era. Now, the idea that you're going to make all your nutrition decisions based on the bone mineral density of gladiators with archaeological evidence, there are at least one or two very small holes in that theory. Um, Greg, you you were telling me some very interesting things about gladiators that I had not yet heard. Um, Yeah, they, they kind of wanted bodybuilders to be, you know... You mean gladiators? Yeah, yeah, gladiators. They wanted gladiators to be, like, a little bit fat um, because, like, so when people think gladiators, they probably think of the movie Gladiator (laughs) where a lot of people are dying in the arena. But for the most part, like, that's not how the vast majority of gladiatorial contests went. Um, They were, like, some died, obviously, but they were somewhat akin to, like, famous athletes of the era And so if there's like a popular gladiator, last thing you want him to do is like get killed in a, in a meaningless match. Um, But you know, the, the, um, the audience still wants to see a show. They want to see some blood. And so they wanted them to be hefty enough that over the course of a fight, um, 
like fighting with somewhat dull blades, they could get cut up and bleed a little bit and it seemed like super intense and dangerous, uh, but without the like without as much risk of them dying. So that that was uh based on what I've read about gladiators, that was like the Romans <laughs> the Romans were somewhat of the opinion of like a lot of people currently where it's like oh if you eat, like obviously bread was a huge part of their diet but the idea being if you eat too much starch you're gonna get fat uh and so they were like yes feed them all of the starch make them kind of fat so they can they can bleed for the people uh and that that at least is what i have read about why the the gladiators diets were what they were yeah, but I mean, the thing that kills me is like I've done DEXA scans on a pretty large number of uh, retired professional football players, American football. And the one thing I can tell you is that most of them have pretty high bone mineral density. And you can see that in the research literature as well. Um, but that is not indicating that you should therefore model your diet <laughs> off of what they're eating because like... Most of them were like, yeah, I don't really work out anymore. And I eat a lot of fried food when I feel like it. Like they had high bone mineral, dens mineral density because they were large athletic people who had been loading the hell out of their skeleton for decades and ate enough. Like they, they did not have inadequate nutrition. One of the like introductory points they made was that Nate Diaz beat Conor McGregor in a fight because eating animal products makes you worse at fighting. Uh, the logic there, not particularly tight or uh, rigorous in my opinion, but they went with it, and that was kind of one of the jumping off points for the whole uh, the whole ordeal with this documentary. So yeah, the, the whole premise of it starts there and then goes on um, and kind of follows several different trajectories related to the, the, the typical arguments you see in favor for, for vegan diets. Uh, some common themes, this is not just them but like anytime you watch a nutrition documentary there's going to be some pretty heavy cherry picking of you know we're going to discuss this research but we're not going to discuss that research we're going to have uh very pro vegan uh guests that we interview but no one to present like the opposite side of that um so there's plenty of that throughout um there's a lot of deriving nutrition evidence from sources that were not nutrition interventions they, they it was like a lot of like little demonstrations with like two or three people it was a lot of a tremendous amount of anecdote and that kind of stuff um there were a lot of really wild uh false dichotomies that were presented um and and there was also a, a total disregard for the idea of like dose response relationships and any distinction between risk and relative risk and so what I mean is that they kind of treated it as this false dichotomy of like, you're either going to eat like a vegan diet or you're going to eat like literally the worst interpretation of like a super high fat processed meat Western diet with a ton of sugars and starches too. Like there, there was really not a lot of discussion of like, okay, what if you had a mostly plant-based diet with a little bit of these particular protein sources? It kind of set things up. Most of the questions it, it attempted to address were either or type situations where in a lot of times, or in a lot of those instances, there was plenty of room for nuance. Um, and they kind of treated animal products as a categorical variable. You know, you're, you're either vegan or you're not. You're either a vegetarian or, or an omnivore. And so they would almost, in certain, in certain places in the documentary, treat the addition of any type of animal source protein as if it was like a categorical thing that officially made the, that meal uh, essentially ruined from a nutritional perspective um, or, or went from being a healthful meal to now a deleterious, unhealthy meal that does harm. And so... This is not unique to this particular documentary. Like if you've been in the game a while, the, a new nutrition documentary comes comes along. It's it's the same thing. Just you know, put whatever label you want on it. There were a couple weird points that they put a lot of effort into proving that probably didn't need to be proved. Uh, so one was that humans are not carnivores. Um, I'm on board with that. 
<laughs> that that makes sense to me. So they, they showed, uh, you know, like a diagram of a jaw and they're like, does that look like a carnivore to you? And I was like, nope. So, well, the, I mean, s- some esteemed sources say otherwise. Correct. Well, we at Stronger by Science, we teach the controversy, which is that <laughs> there's there's two sides of that story. Um, they They went really hard on the whole like, okay, let me ask you this. Cows have more muscle than a human, but cows don't eat meat. How do you explain that one? And that's a, uh, hmm. I can't tell you the last time I had a pain in my second stomach. You know, <laughs> like it just makes apps. It's like it's like if someone was like, you know, I heard that circadian rhythms were important important for health. But how come raccoons are awake all night? Like, well, because they're not they're not people. They have their own rhythm. Like, yeah. And and, and so t- to be clear for anyone wondering about ruminant physiology, uh, they have a bunch of bacteria in their hind gut. Um, that bacteria breaks down proteins and particularly cellulose in the plants that they eat, and then they regurgitate that. And then swallow it into like the stomach that's associated with their digestive tract, and so they largely derive their uh, their protein from both the amino acids from the proteins um, broken down by the plants. Actually, I lied. They do have bacteria to break down cellulose, not a protein, but they 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 do have bacteria that break down the other proteins in the plants. But one of the main places they get uh, protein from is the actual bacteria from their hind gut that they then swallow uh there's apparently a pretty reasonable amount of protein in that so like ultimately cows do end up uh deriving considerably more usable protein from the plants that they consume largely via the bacteria than uh humans would be able to derive from consuming the exact same plant stuffs they they didn't really go into that part yeah um I'm just trying to provide value for the listener. <laughs> yeah. So for some reason, that was not a high priority on their list of points to make. One of the points that they spent a lot of time trying to reinforce also counts as another one of their uh, false dichotomies. And, you know, for some reason, they felt really intent on proving that uh, protein is not a, a key uh, energy substrate during high intensity exercise. Uh, regardless of what kind of diet you eat, I don't know anyone that has pushed that idea within the last like probably 50 to 100 years. But uh, in any case, they, they spent a lot of time trying to really reinforce this idea that, you know, athletes all think that you need animal proteins to fuel your exercise. But in reality, you need carbohydrates. First of all, like I said, I, I don't think really anybody in the contemporary sporting world it really believes that, that you need proteins, whether they're from plants or animals, as a key energy substrate for high intensity exercise. And more importantly, it kind of created this weird dichotomy where it's like you, you're you either going to have a high carb diet or you're going to have a diet that includes some amount of animal products or animal proteins. And it's a, it's a dichotomy that just has absolutely no basis. And again, it's trying to refute this idea like i I don't know who out there is thinking that their key predominant energy substrate for high for high intensity exercise work is animal protein uh but that's not the case and the, the whole discussion surrounding that weird dichotomy just made no sense to me because i eat uh generally speaking a pretty high carb diet with all sorts of animal proteins all throughout it so it just a lot of wasted effort that didn't make a lot of sense um, a couple other things they did, they, they, they did a bunch of these like little mini experiments, um, basically just showing that the postprandial effects of different meals were different. I didn't find them to be particularly informative. And they also like really had a, a disregard for the idea of protein quality. And while I, I understand, like, listen, if you have a reasonably, you know, diverse, uh, a diverse diet that is getting amino acids from several different sources and you're eating generally enough, yeah, you're you're probably not going to be uh, clinically deficient in any particular amino acid, most likely. Um, But but they kind of like threw out the entire concept of protein quality as like a 
just completely not useful concept whatsoever. And in sport nutrition, that's, uh, that's just not what, what the evidence would indicate. And like, maybe that particular claim wasn't supposed to relate to sport necessarily. And was just like, Hey, you won't die of a horrible deficiency. But, um, when your documentary is kind of athlete after athlete, after athlete, it lends itself to saying you have to be able to apply these, these claims to sport if you're going to put a huge percentage of your documentary together around athletes who use this diet for, you know, potential performance or recovery benefits. Um, a couple low lights. Um, there is an absolutely tragic scene with a leg press. I don't even want to talk about it, Greg. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I, I mean, he, you, you should be clear with the people. It wasn't a tragedy insofar as like the leg press tragedies that have been called on video where someone hyperextends their leg and their lower body explodes is more just like a horrendously poorly performed leg press. A forehead touched two knees. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so that was, that was a low light. <laughs> um, uh, it, like I said, there were some experiments that were like, th- there was a way to do experiments. There's a whole field dedicated to it. You want to do nutrition experiments, go do nutrition experiments. But there are these weird demonstrations that they uh, presented as if they were like rigorous scientific evidence, which was just like, eh, no thanks. They invoked a lot of scary imagery toward the end about like, you know, the various trade organizations that promote protein intake, uh, very explicitly compared them to uh, tobacco companies trying to muddy the research waters with with misinformation and then linked that to making sure that they were feeding like plenty of sick people to the big scary pharmaceutical industry um so that was a low light for me um there was also a urologist on who's spent a pretty large amount of time like really gleefully talking about uh nocturnal erections like nighttime erections that you get while you're sleeping and they did this like experiment thing with with three people it didn't really make a lot of sense because i i I don't know who is making their major dietary decisions based on the frequency or relative rigidity of their nighttime erections while they sleep it just doesn't seem like a key consideration when it comes to putting together an overall diet but they spent a pretty significant amount of time on that and the whole experiment they did was just strange it didn't really make sense and I, I don't see a great deal of relevance for why that experiment should have any indication uh, as to whether or not I decide to eat animal products it, it just seemed to be fairly irrelevant and a very basic demonstration of the fact that there are some things in the diet that can acutely affect or impair blood flow nothing very revolutionary there so conclusions, uh, after watching this, um, you know, it was like every doc, uh, nutrition documentary pretty much ever. Um, th- there's a way to progress the science as it pertains to nutrition. It's not through rivaling documentaries. Uh, so you're not going to walk away from it with, uh, any remarkable revelations and the paradigm for how we understand nutrition has in fact not been shifted. Now, I've said a lot of dismissive things about the documentary itself. Um, Those should not be interpreted as dismissive things about plant-based diets or even vegan diets. Uh, You can absolutely put together a very well-formulated vegan diet. If you uh, are on a vegan diet for uh, religious purposes, for ethical purposes, uh, whatever the case may be, I, I fully support that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with being on a vegan diet. It can be you can be on a remarkably healthful vegan diet that absolutely fully supports your athletic endeavors. So um, being dismissive of a documentary is not the same as being dismissive of plant-based diets in general. And so if you want to walk away with this, uh, with some kind of informative final take on the (laughs) the, the state of nutrition after this documentary uh, was shared with the world, it's pretty much the same. And I think if your focus is on living a nice, healthy, productive life uh, as it pertains to making your nutrition choices, we still know, generally speaking, what some safe bets are. Be active, uh, maintain your body composition in a relatively healthy state of leanness, uh, scale your calorie intake to your activity level so that you're not uh, 
consistently overeating, eat a whole bunch of vegetables and fiber. Like vegetables are awesome for you. So that, that is one of the things that, you know, one of the good things about this documentary is it, it highlighted many, many good things about vegetables, which are unequivocally awesome. You still don't want to eat a bunch of like torched, burnt, charred, fatty, processed meats. That's still not a great idea as we've discussed previously. Um, you know, if you kind of twisted my arm and you said, Eric, you need to tell me like what, what to you makes sense as a sensible diet. Um, and it's gotta be one of the diets that has a name. I, I think that I probably lean most towards something resembling like a Mediterranean type diet. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying like it's the end all be all for diets, but if you were to ask me like, Hey Eric, what makes sense for dieting? I'd say, well, eat a whole bunch of different vegetables that tend to be pretty fibrous that give you a bunch of micronutrients, get some nice, uh, get some nice grain products in the mix. As long as you don't have any underlying health issues that would preclude it a little bit of fruit in the mix with plenty of fiber, you know, get some nice fish, get some, some protein sources in the mix. You're good to go. Um, I don't, I don't know why that's such a controversial take. I don't, I don't know why we got to keep doing this thing where it's like, you should either only eat steak or you should only eat lettuce. Uh, you can put together a diet many different ways and make it work. Plants are still awesome, but, uh, you know, th this documentary in terms of providing a compelling argument that is robust to counter arguments, uh, it falls short. So my final review, everybody knows you always review, review a movie, uh, on a scale of one to five bags of popcorn. Um, in this case, I'm going to give it two bags of popcorn covered in margarine. Uh, the second bag comes because uh, Arnold is in it and you have to give Arnold a bag of popcorn. So you go from the bare minimum one bag of popcorn up to now two bags of popcorn. The production quality was also good. I got to give him that. I think it was produced by James Cameron. So you can think of this as the Terminator 2 of nutrition documentaries interesting story about Terminator 2. Arnold's performance in Terminator 2 was so compelling that one of my family members was brought to tears by the excellent dramatic work. So uh, Arnold got absolutely snubbed, should have gotten the Oscar for it. But in any case, very, very wonderful movie. I thought Terminator 2 was uh, considerably more enjoyable than The Game Changers. The production quality, the nuts and bolts of the audio and video was quite good. Uh, the robust nature of the argument presented, not super great. Um, one thing to keep in mind also, when you think of like, well, there's these studies saying that like vegans live way longer than, than omnivores. When you look at the studies that actually try to really deal with a big problem in that literature, which is the presence of other health related behaviors. So like if you've made the decision to go vegan, you've made a health decision that requires pretty, pretty big buy-in on the front end. And so one way that people study is like, just compare vegans to like any random omnivore who also like smokes and hasn't exercised in seven years. Um, but when you compare people who went vegan for health related reasons to people who are generally health conscious omnivores, those differences in lifespan and, and chronic disease risk essentially disappear. So like that, that's one other thing in the documentary. They went really, they really, really leaned into this idea that like, if you go vegan, you're going to live way longer. Of course, you, a vegan can be a very, very sensible way to design your diet, assuming that you, uh, you know, put it together effectively and you get all, you know, get your amino acids sorted out, you get your B12 sorted out and all that stuff. But uh, the idea that it's like an immediate life extender compared to a very well-constructed omnivorous diet uh, doesn't really hold up with the literature. So uh, because Arnold's in it, we have two bags of popcorn and uh, to appease the filmmakers, we're going to cover that in margarine rather than butter. Good deal. Uh, if you are interested in, you know, trying out a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, uh, if you aren't currently a vegan or vegetarian, or if you're a vegan or vegetarian and you want to know how you could improve or optimize your diet for athletic performance, we do have a guest article on Stronger by Science about that uh, published last year. 
uh, title is Plant Gains, Advice to Vegetarian and Vegan Athletes. Uh, it's quite good. It got shared in like one of the vegan fitness subreddits. And by and large, they were like, whoa, these are really high protein recommendations. Otherwise, great article. Uh, so it it has uh, like half of a like vegan fitness community's seal of approval. I think it's quite good work. Um, and so, yeah, we can link that in the show notes. So if you are interested in setting up like more of an evidence-based vegetarian or vegan diet, um, check out that article. I, I think you'll get a fair amount out of it. Yeah. And like, so, you know, the other day I told you, like, I'm officially dieting, not for a show, but I was like, yeah, I need to get leaner. The first thing I do when I'm like, oh, it's time to get leaner. I trend toward leaner protein sources and I increase my vegetable intake dramatically. So it's not like I'm some like, you know, veggie hater, or I think that you need to eat like a super meat heavy diet or anything like that. But it's just like, dude, you can do vegan and make like a a solid evidence-based case for vegan diets. Like that, that's a thing you could do. And that's a thing that if that's, what they did i'd be like oh wow thank you for informing the public it probably wouldn't have been as entertaining uh (laughs) for anybody like that's why whenever you're like hey how come all the documentaries are like really dramatic and rarely um just have a bunch of scientists and then like the nocturnal erections guy (laughs) yeah yeah i mean it was yeah it's a really good nutrition documentary would be like a few really solid uh really solid nutrition researchers around a table say, Hey, let's try to find some common ground here. We'll clearly delineate the areas where we have disagreement and then we'll put it all together at the end. No one's interested. That's not going to be fun. You're probably right about that. Yeah. Okay. For our next segment, Greg is going to share a research roundup about some recent studies related to training. Yeah. So there's been a lot of cool stuff that's been published recently. Um, so first paper that I would like to briefly discuss is titled Acute Effects of Foam Rolling on Range of Motion in Healthy Adults, a Systematic Review and Multi-Level Meta-Analysis by Wilk and colleagues. Uh, and so basically what they were doing in this meta is they wanted to compare the acute effects of foam rolling on range of motion compared to A, nothing, and then B to static stretching. So for the studies that included both a foam rolling and a static stretching condition. Um, And so basically what they found is that foam rolling is unsurprisingly better than nothing. Um, Reasonably large effect size, kind of if you use the standard Cohen's cutoff, it was uh, right between a a medium and a large effect uh, at 0.74. However, Foam rolling and stretching had essentially the same effect size. So the the standardized mean difference there was 0.02, which is nothing. Um, So none of that should really surprise anyone. I I feel like a few years ago, people were way, way more bored the foam rolling train and way, way more Um, anti-stretching. There were a lot of people who went so far as to say like, oh, like, acute stretching will slightly improve stretch tolerance but will like barely affect range of motion but foam rolling has been sent by the gods and is the best thing and it's going to tremendously improve your uh, acute mobility and you know you know it seems like both of them are effective and similarly effective um so that's cool just a decent thing to note uh i, I kind of think the actionable thing for this study is you know if you like foam rolling foam roll if you prefer stretching, stretch. Uh, both of them, if you overdo it, it can decrease acute force output and performance. If you do like a moderate amount of either of them, it's probably going to be fine. Uh, so yeah, if you need to work on range of motion before training, pick which one you like, do it. It'll be fine. Um, one interesting thing about this study is uh, they look to see if there are any significant moderators And one of the things they found both when comparing foam rolling to nothing and then comparing foam rolling to stretching 
is it seemed like the impact of foam rolling was larger for females than males. So when comparing foam rolling to nothing, the acute effect on range of motion, uh, the standardized mean difference was 0.95 for women, which is a pretty large effect, and 0.35 for men, which is a pretty small effect. Uh, and then I don't remember right off the top of my head what it was with stretching, but it was something like uh, point th like a standardized mean difference of 0.3 in favor of foam rolling for females and about 0.4 in favor of static stretching over foam rolling for males. Um, the, the authors had a line that was uh, just like the reasons for this remain to be elucidated or something like that. Like basically they didn't even throw out a hypothesis for why that would be the case. I've been stewing over this. I can't come up with a good reason why foam rolling wouldn't be as effective in men. Um, but it's worth noting that they found it both for like the isolated effects of foam rolling and foam rolling compared to static stretching. And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like a subgroup analysis where there were like three studies looking at it. I want to say, you know, you know, there wasn't a huge body of literature. I think there were 20... I think 26 studies in total included in this meta-analysis, uh, and there were I think eight in the like subsample um, where you could where you could compare uh, men and women in the in the effects of foam rolling. Um, so it seems to be like a somewhat robust and reliable finding, but I can't think of a good reason why that would be the case. Is anything coming to mind for you, Trex? No, not at all. Not at all. All right. Um, so yeah, do with that what you will. Foam rolling generally seems to work. Um, possibly works better in females. Why is, why is that? Who knows? I tell you what, I much prefer it that way though. Like it, it, it can go a couple different ways. Like sometimes you observe a thing that you can't explain first and you're like, well, I guess we'll have to try to see if we keep observing this and then try to figure it out from there. But, you know, that beats the alternative, which is when people like theorize the, their way into thinking there's some like really important distinction and some kind of uh, training or nutrition outcome. And like the data just like never supports it. But they're like, no, it has to be this way because of this like physiology theory like, yeah. from like textbook knowledge. And like, yeah, sometimes people go so far with theorizing without ever confirming that it's something we observe in real life. Mm -hmm. So uh, but it, it is, I mean, very surprising very unexpected so it'll be interesting if people in that area of research kind of see that paper and say well let's dive into this thing and and design a couple studies yeah yeah for sure i mean yeah i i have no idea why that would be the case but yeah it, it would it would be pretty cool if like future research could elucidate a mechanism there um because, yeah, I mean, it, it could very well be that if for whatever reason you're trying to maximize range of motion either acutely or increases in range of motion chronically, it could very well be that the the best approach to that differs based on sex. Um, I don't know that we currently have research to, like, research giving us physiological mechanisms to explain why that would be the case. Uh, but if that did turn out to be the case, you know, maybe this is kind of our first inkling that 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 is something to look into further. All right, moving on to the next study. Uh, this is by Morrow and colleagues. Title is Low Skeletal Muscle Capillarization Limits Muscle Adaptations to Resistance Training in Older Adults. Um, so what they did is they took a relatively small sample, 19 total subjects, 10 males and 9 females, um, and had them do a whole body resistance training program for 12 weeks. And what they did is they, um, they, they divided them based on capillary density. Uh, and so they had like retroactively, they had a group of people with low capillary density and a group of people with high capillary density. And what they found is that uh, both capillary density was um, like significantly associated in terms of like, you know, just a straight up correlation with uh, muscle hypertrophy after resistance training. Um, and they also found that like on a group level, the people who they defined as having a higher capillary density did experience significant hypertrophy, whereas the group of people with low capillary density did not. 
Um, and so this was this was an interesting study because it was essentially a replication. Uh, there was a study from maybe two or three years ago by Snyders uh, and colleagues that found essentially the same thing. Um, and so one, I'm a sucker for a good replication. I don't think replications get as much love as they deserve, but they're absolutely fundamental to the scientific process. Uh, and then two, I think that, so <laughs> this study kind of feeds into one of my pet theories for what limits hypertrophy. So th I think this is something we've talked about on the podcast before, but we we talk a lot about, you know, practical ways to, to maximize muscle growth or what research says about like, oh, does this level of volume cause more growth than this level of volume? Or like, does periodization have an impact, blah, 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 whatever. But we very rarely sit down and ask the question, like, why do we stop growing in the first place? Because, you know, you start training, you get bigger, uh, you train for longer, you keep getting bigger, but at a slightly slower rate. And then eventually, like, I mean, it seems like virtually everyone eventually just hits a plateau, uh, past which either they just can't grow, or maybe they're still growing, but at such a slow rate, it's basically imperceptible. And so the question is, like, why does that happen? Um, and I don't think we currently have a good explanation as to why. So, you know, the, the most basic thing that's going on when your muscles are getting bigger, smaller, is just muscle protein balance. Uh, we don't see that muscle protein breakdown really ramps up as people get more well-trained. And we don't have that much muscle protein synthesis data after training on... Uh, on people with a fair amount of training experience. But what we do have indicates that, yeah, like the total muscle protein synthetic response in terms of like area under the curve for 72 hours post-training isn't as big for trained lifters as it is for untrained lifters, but it's like half as big. Uh, but certainly people who've been training for 10 years aren't growing at half the rate as people who've been training for two months. Um so, like, yeah, it's it's a weird question. Like, why do we eventually stop growing? And my hypothesis is that it might just purely have to do with oxygen delivery. And I think that people, um, I don't know, I think people sleep on just, like, the importance of geometry in respiration. Uh, so eukaryotic cells are um, way bigger than... Uh, Oh, God, the word slipped in my mind. Yeah, prokaryotic? yeah, prokaryotic cells. Um, and one of the primary reasons why, or the primary reason why, is mitochondria. So essentially, you need uh, a membrane across which for like the electron flow to take place to synthesize ATP. And prokaryotes do that across their cell membrane. And so you wind up with a surface area to volume ratio problem. I promise you didn't come into this podcast expecting to hear about marathons and geometry and respiration, but it's happening, just deal with it. So <laughs> prokaryotic cells are reasonably small because it's a surface area to volume ratio problem. As a cell gets bigger, volume increases faster than surface area. If the, if the surface area is largely what determines the maximal rate of respiration, then as the cell gets bigger and bigger, it can't produce enough energy to power the stuff inside the cell. So that keeps prokaryotic cells reasonably small. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, have internal mitochondria. Those mitochondria can have a lot of like membrane surface area, um, and you can have a bunch of mitochondria inside a cell to allow the cell to make you know a bunch of ATP and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that that's one of the primary reasons why eukaryotic cells can be so much larger than prokaryotic cells. Um, but ultimately, it's still comes down to oxygen delivery and ATP production. And so if you have more muscle capillarization, you have more capillaries in contact with each muscle fiber, um, and so they can deliver more oxygen to the muscle fibers themselves. But as the fibers get larger, like let's say you have four capillaries in contact with a single muscle fiber. If that muscle fiber gets larger, then one, like, you know, per unit of area inside the fiber, the amount of oxygen that can be delivered goes down. 
And then also like stuff in the middle of the muscle fiber is now a further distance from those capillaries. So the diffusion distance from the outside of the cell uh, just takes a greater distance and more time for oxygen to diffuse to the middle of the cell where a bunch of stuff is. Um, and so I'm of the opinion that there, there is at least an, an argument to be made that one of the things that ultimately limits uh, total muscle growth is total fiber size. Um, and one of the things that limits total fiber size is just the ability to get enough oxygen to those fibers. So, you know, I'll note this study and the older Snyder study, both performed in older adults. Um, so, you know, take that for what it is. Uh, but I do think that there's, I do think that there's a theoretical reason to expect that eventually a single muscle fiber can get too large for it to really make sense for it to keep growing unless like capillaries per fiber goes up so it can get more oxygen to it. And I think there has to be some theoretical limit for how large fibers can kind of allow themselves to get just because those just because those uh, diffusion distances for oxygen and carbon dioxide keep going up as well. Uh, and one other thing I'll note is there's there aren't a ton of studies, but there are a handful of studies um, looking at muscle fiber size of trained lifters compared to untrained lifters. Uh, finding, obviously, trained lifters have larger muscle fibers than untrained lifters, but then they train the untrained lifters for a number of months. I, I want to say one of the main papers here was McDougal, 1982, 87, something like that. Had people train for six months, uh, and at that point in time, the uh, previously untrained lifters' muscle fibers were, at that point, the same size as folks who'd been training for, like, 10, 12 years. And so then that opens up the question, like, why do some people wind up so much bigger than others? Do they just wind up with a lot more fibers and their total fiber size winds up, winds up being, you know, the same as everyone else's, but they just had way more to begin with, or that potentially opens the door for maybe hyperplasia is taking place. And that's another very contentious topic. Um, but anyway, I feel like I've gotten considerably off topic, but, but I think we just need to think more about why would eventually why would people eventually stop growing and i think that just just gas exchange and respiration is is likely to be a big factor of that um and so th this is another paper finding that people with greater capillary density uh respond better to hypertrophic training than people with lower capillary density so th this is still kind of like a somewhat half baked and not fully fleshed out idea but i I don't know. I think it's worth at least considering. It's also really interesting that um, whatever the reason, muscles always stop growing when you hit a fat-free mass index of 25, which is pretty <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> physiologically, I don't think we're, we know why yet, but 25 is, in fact, the number that I read on the internet. You, you know, someone's going to clip that. And <laughs> and you will see that brought up in an argument unironically at some uh, point. No, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I did have a question for you, though. Yo. Um, so what you've talked about in terms of capillary density, do you think that's actionable? Like, do you think that at certain levels of muscularity, it would make sense to try to uh, pursue methods of enhancing capillarity to, to further promote hypertrophy down the road? So that would certainly be an implication, and I think that that is, it's something that would be a pain in the ass to test, but would be testable. So, uh, for example, we see in we see in untrained lifters that higher load and lower load training tend to cause relatively similar hypertrophy. Um, however, one thing that I would be interested in seeing is if you could recruit a sample of people who were plateaued and you verified that they were plateaued, like say having a eight week lead in where you have people do, you know, a, a decent program of moderate load training. And then if, if people do grow, you're say you say like, oh no, you were just training like a pussy beforehand. You weren't actually plateaued. Get the fuck out of my study. But then the people who actually don't grow and you're like, okay, there's you think you're plateaued. We trained you pretty well for a while. You do very much seem to be plateaued. 
Now let's like put you through a phase where we do try to increase capillary density, uh, maybe by like high rep training with, with short rest intervals, um, should theoretically increase capillary density and just like give it a shot dog and see if, if that helps those people grow a little bit more. Uh, I don't know that it would, but that, that would be a way that you could test it. So, you know, maybe like low load training, not a great idea or like not, not better than conventional training for most people, but potentially a way to get past a plateau and keep making some progress for people who are already quite advanced. I mean, that's a possibility and it's, it's at least a testable hypothesis. Yeah. All right. So the next study I'm going to look at is by Barreto et al. The title is Protective Effect Conferred by Isometric Preconditioning Against Slow and Fast Velocity Eccentric Exercise Induced Muscle Damage. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Anyway, so what they did in this study is they uh, they took untrained lifters and had them do... So they, they had four groups of untrained lifters. One of the groups did uh, like fast speed eccentric training. Uh, Another group did slower speed eccentric training. Another group did fast speed eccentric training 48 hours after isometric training. And then a third group did slow speed eccentric training 48 hours after isometric training. So two fast eccentric groups, two slow eccentric groups, two groups that didn't do isometric preconditioning, two groups that did do isometric preconditioning. And so they were they were interested in a number of outcomes, but I think the ones that were um, probably the most useful and relevant is they were looking at voluntary uh, concentric contraction peak torque. So basically just like force output strength. Uh, and then they also looked at subjective assessments of soreness. Um, and so what they found is that In general, it was a little bit harder to recover from the fast speed eccentrics than the slow speed eccentrics, but the the isometric preconditioning prior to both fast and slow speed eccentrics uh, led to faster recovery of maximal torque and also um, smaller increases in muscle soreness and quicker amelioration of muscle soreness. Uh, So the isometric preconditioning they did was um, like 10 sets of a three second maximal uh, isometric contraction with 45 seconds between contractions. So, you know, something that would take, what, a grand total of like eight minutes, give or take. Um, And so, you know, it should be noted, the subjects in this study were untrained. However, I think that this is still useful for some of our listeners. So for example, if, um, you know, let's say you've been dealing with a bum knee and you haven't squatted for a while and haven't done much hard lower body training. Um, first time you get back under the bar and really get after it doing some squats or deadlifts or whatever, you're probably going to be pretty wrecked the next day. Uh, that could negatively impact your training the rest of the week, you know, make it a little bit harder to ease back into training. So something you could do is your first session back just do some isometric training. And from the looks of it in this paper, it doesn't have to be super, super intense isometric training. So, you know, 10, 10 bouts of three seconds really pushing hard. Um, not not going to be all that difficult. Uh, and then, you know, if you train two days after that, it seems like, you know, you are probably still going to be quite sore and you are probably going to still have sizable decrements and force output for 24, 48 hours post-training. But the the isometric preconditioning helps ameliorate a lot of that considerably. So you can probably apply that to your own training if you have a layoff for whatever reason, be that for injury, just, you know, losing your motivation for a while, whatever, going on vacation. Um, and also, if you're a trainer and you train untrained lifters, this is something you could apply to your coaching practice. So... <laughs> I, I think a lot of us have probably had this experience before. New lifter walks in the door. Uh, you put them through a little assessment. You get an idea of their goals. Uh, you draw up a training program for them. First day, you don't want to kill them. But, you know, you want to challenge them a little bit. Uh, and then you get a text message the next day 
or you know you see them a couple days later and they're not happy with you uh you warn them they were probably going to be sore but they are just earth shatteringly sore uh I, i think a lot of us who've been training for a decade forget how god awful we felt after our first ever training session um but man it can be rough so you know uh it may not be a bad idea to do you know do that assessment and then whatever exercises you plan to do in their actual first training session you know that first day in the gym just have them do some isometrics and tell them uh like hey, this will help you, you know, maybe start developing a mind-muscle connection. You can feel these muscles that are supposed to be contracting. Nothing's moving. That's going to help you feel this contraction a little bit better. So you could sell it to them that way. Uh, And then in their first real workout they do, they're probably going to be a little bit less sore and a little bit less pissed off at you. Um, And I'll note that this, so this study used isometrics. There have been other studies in the past that have used like standard dynamic training and it it very much seems like it's a pretty good idea for again like a first session after a layoff or someone's first session in the gym period seems to be a pretty good idea to take that session pretty easy again three second isometrics here i think some other research has used like dog like sets at 10 at like 30 40 percent one rm so like really easy stuff uh, finding that, you know, after that, um, you're considerably less sore after your first real workout. Uh, so the, the collection of adaptations that helps, you know, protect against decrements in performance and soreness after training are collectively known as the repeated bout effect, uh, or the repeated bouts effect. And it seems like, you know, eccentric exercise helps a lot with that training volume is going to help kind of accrue more of those adaptations but uh like just to kick off the process and get some of those adaptations rolling to really get some some protective benefits in your next like real workout it seems like you really really don't need much at all so you know pretty low intensity training maybe some isometrics um shouldn't be too sore or worn down from that and then you shouldn't be as sore and worn down from your next real session following that. Makes sense to me. All right. And the final study I want to look at today, uh, the title is The Association of Resistance Training with Mortality, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. I don't particularly want to attempt to pronounce the first author's name. So I will say the senior author's name is Lopez Jimenez and colleagues (laughs) oh speaking of which a listener sent us something to help us learn how to pronounce things yeah he did and uh man that seemed like a lot of work yeah we're gonna get around to using that eventually i don't think it's gonna help for names though will it i mean it may or may not Um, we have to look into it yeah listener thank you for sending that it was very passive aggressive so in a way (laughs) shame on you for sending that but also thank you for sending that we will get around to it very soon (laughs) maybe (laughs) uh okay so um yeah so this was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at uh whether or not and then the degree to which resistance training decreased mortality risk mortality being dying um and so they scanned 1430 studies They wound up finding 11 that met their inclusion criteria. Uh, The mean follow-up was 8.85 years. So uh, unfortunately, when something shows a 20% decrease in mortality risk, that doesn't mean that you then only have an 80% chance of dying. And in fact, a 20% chance of living forever would be cool if that was the case. But it's like, okay, what are the odds that you die in the next nine years since that was the mean follow-up? Um, so anyway, they were looking at, uh, the degree to which resistance training, uh, throughout a lifespan decreased mortality risk, and then whether adding additional aerobic training would decrease mortality risk further. Um, and so TLDR version is, uh, yeah, resistance training is good. Reduced mortality risk by about 21% on average. Uh, confidence interval there is from about 9% to 
to 31%, which seems like a big confidence interval, but uh, wasn't that close to, to crossing um, a hazards ratio of one. So it was like solidly statistically significant. Uh, 21% reduction, pretty solid. Um, however, when you add aerobic training into the mix as well, uh, so you're doing resistance training and aerobic exercise, um, that basically doubles the protective effect. So it reduced the um, the the hazards ratio for mortality from uh, 21% to 40%, which is good. Um, so yeah, resistance training makes you less likely to die over the next nine years, which is good, and do some cardio as well. You will be twice as unlikely to die, which is even better. Um, so yeah, th this was this was a good paper. Uh, I think. I think a lot of the medical profession has really come around on resistance training in recent years. I know it wasn't that long ago that like, you know, there was research saying, hey, cardio is good. Resistance training is also good. But your doctor would like only tell you to ever do cardio and would kind of give the side eye to resistance training. Um, I think that a lot of, I think for a lot of uh, medical practitioners, that's kind of shifting uh, and they are recognizing the benefits of resistance training more and more. Um, but if not, you know, if you uh, if you have a doctor who is combative and says you should run, lifting is dumb, uh, may not be a bad idea to send them this paper and say, hey, running is good, but so is lifting. Uh, what if I did both? Anyway, so cool study, I would say. It's kind of making me feel like I should make a bold claim so what i'm thinking is <laughs> what i'm thinking is you write a book right and you say listen so running with aer uh, aerobic plus resistance that's reducing mortality by what 40 percent yeah and then according to some interesting uh, cinematic literature i reviewed let's say going vegan reduces it by like 60 percent yeah so now we're talking 100 percent reduction and then we do a graphic design where i'm on a beach in like a beach towel and there's just a bold claim on the cover of the book I just wrote. And it says like how to make sure you definitely won't die in the next nine years. That'd be sick. That would be a nice book. Very tasteful graphic design, very good font combinations, but we could probably do it in a couple weeks. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get our best people on that. Okay. Now to play us out. So I, I posted an Instagram post the other day. If you want to follow me on Instagram to send hate mail, my handle is at Trexler Fitness. Because I just realized we kind of like, we took a swipe at a vegan documentary and like a pro carnivore book. Um, and then our, our interview is about keto, which explains a couple limitations of keto. So basically like we're done. <laughs> we're, we're done. We're going to get a, everyone's upset. And people over the last two episodes have had to deal with us talking about prokaryotes and Bayesian statistics. So we're just, it's just going to be all hate mail from here on out. Um, but anyway, I posted an Instagram post about... Uh, I, I mean, we unironically are going to get a considerable amount of hate mail for this episode. Yeah, and as you guys know, usually that's the type of thing that temporary guests would handle. So go ahead and send all that to Greg and not me. Um, as the permanent singular host, I, I usually don't deal with that kind of stuff. So send all that to Greg. But anyway, so I made an Instagram post uh, about I'm kind of coming back from a back injury. I hurt my back wrestling a million years ago. Every now and then I aggravate it because I'm impatient and stupid. And uh, so I posted about it and then the uh the pt we just hired on our coaching staff jason kind of jokingly sent me an email he's like dude you can't always be hurt it's kind of making me look bad <laughs> but anyway he was like joking around because like it's an old wrestling injury it comes and goes by the way i should be very clear here i am not currently nor have i ever been under the treatment of jason he is not at all responsible for my general state of disrepair at the moment um 
Jason's very good at what he does, but I am very stubborn and I don't take advice from anybody. And I also don't make time to actually fix my problems. I just ignore them until they're no longer my top priority problem. So uh, (laughs) Jason was joking around like, dude, you can't always be hurt. This makes me look bad. Let me reassure the entire world. uh, If I actually had the patience to actually talk to Jason and do what he tells me, I'd probably be in a much better spot, but I'm stubborn. I am the stereotypical old man that doesn't listen to doctors or smart people or really anybody else. But in any case, we we finally, I finally at least had some degree of conversation with Jason about the general premise of me being in pain. Uh, and he, he dropped a really great line that I wanted to share with everybody because I thought it was so useful. And it was just one of those statements that in, it, it's not uh, groundbreaking in terms of the actual content, but it's such a simple, nice way to put it. If you're listening now and you haven't heard our interview with Michael Ray, we got a lot of really positive feedback on that interview. Really fascinating stuff about kind of a a more modern, updated way of viewing pain science, specifically as it pertains to training. But Jason and I kind of continue that conversation and he left me with a quote that I thought was like, a really perfect way to wrap it up in a singular sentence. Um, like if you were listening to that conversation, you're like, yeah, but can you boil it down to a sentence? Um, and I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. I thought it was just too good of a quote to leave it in my email inbox and not share it with people. And so basically what he said was, uh, it's important to remember that sensitivity doesn't mean harm. And uh, so as I'm coming back from this injury, uh, obviously, you know, hey, If you're a practitioner, stay in your scope of practice. If you need medical help, go get medical help. There's the disclaimer. But what I'm using to kind of guide me back, and I'm sure a lot of people are in similar situations coming back from, you know, an aggravation or or even a new injury. um, It's this idea of viewing pain as it's useful feedback. But within that biopsychosocial model, there are many inputs that influence it. And it's good to use that feedback, but we shouldn't be necessarily afraid of movement, assuming that we're doing it in a smart way and working back in a, in a fairly intelligent manner. So I just thought that was a super good quote for people who are like, how do I convey this to people? Or how do I turn this into like an applicable, like really actionable summary statement? I thought that was awesome. And I think the reason it resonated with me was because it's kind of the way I view dieting to an extent. Um, so like a lot of times, you know, I don't know anything about injury. So, you know, I I claim no expertise in that area. But when it comes to dieting, I know a thing or two. And I often work with people who want to lose fat. And the thing I always tell them, like, just like that, you know, uh, sensitivity doesn't mean harm. I tell a lot of times people fear hunger when they're dieting the way that someone coming back from an injury fears pain. And a lot of times people when they start to perceive any semblance of hunger, they're like, well, that's it. From here on out throughout the process, we are going to be miserable. And hunger is this horrible thing that needs to be avoided at all costs. And when it's present, we're screwed. And sometimes when people are doing like really ambitious diets that involve getting really, really lean or losing really large amounts of weight, one of the most positive things you can do is say, we're not going to take some kind of fearful approach to to hunger. We're not going to try to avoid it as if it's this thing that is you know, inherently remarkably problematic. This is a piece of feedback. We'll use it. We'll work around it. It'll be part of the process. But, uh, but yeah, I just thought that was a really solid quote to kind of wrap up a lot of the things we talked about with, uh, with Michael Ray. So if you haven't listened to that interview, it's honestly, I'd say probably one of the better ones we've done. Uh, Michael shared a ton of really cool information that, uh, might help you might help some of your clients. Okay, so to finish off this episode, we've got another fantastic interview. This one is with a different Michael. This one is with Michael Hull, who works over at examine.com. And they fairly recently put out a big, uh, what would you call it? Is it an ebook or a, a guide? I think either would be appropriate. A guide in the form of an ebook uh, about ketogenic diets. A very, very solid, uh, you know, very evidence based and really doesn't come come from the perspective of trying to sell you on it or try to bash you or try to bash the diet it basically is is right down the middle unbiased evidence based of you know what keto could be good for what it doesn't seem to be good for 
and essentially everything you'd want to know about it. So we were really lucky. We got Michael Hull on the line and, and talked to him and basically hit him with all our questions about the ketogenic diet, what it could be good for, who might want to uh, skip out on it. So um, really fantastic interview, and it'll start on the other end of the music. Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. Uh, today, Greg and I are joined by Michael Hull from examine.com. Michael, thanks for coming by. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, guys. So, Michael, you are working at examine.com. That is your, your, your primary gig right now, your only gig. So what exactly is it that you do at examine? So I'm one of the uh, uh, senior researchers over at examine.com. This is, I think, my fourth or fifth year with these guys. Um, but my primary primary responsibility is uh, updating the supplement guides. Um, it's one of our uh, few products that we have um, that helps uh, guide people on uh, what supplements to look at or what supplements to not look at for specific health endpoints, sleep, exercise, um, the full gamut really. And so how'd you get involved with Exam and what's your, uh, your academic background? So I did my undergraduate degree at George Mason University. I did uh, my undergrad in uh, exercise science with a minor in nutrition, and I just completed my master's degree uh, in uh, a nutritional science at McGill University. Um, I actually got scooped up uh, by Kamal um, back when I was an undergraduate. As a, I started working for them as an intern. Um, he just happened to see uh, one of my blog posts. Um, he liked it. Uh, we reached out. We connected, and uh, here we are, four years later. Is that uh, is that blog still active? Yeah, I haven't. I don't really update it that much because uh, exam takes up a lot of my time. But yeah, my uh, my original blog is uh, is still up and kicking out there on the internet. Very cool. What's the name of it? Uh, the it's called nutritionasiknowit dot com, and uh, the blog post he uh, uh, ended up uh, uh, reaching uh, reaching out to me about was uh, a review of the whole thirty diet. Oh, that Back was you. That was, I yeah, I remember that website and that article, and did oh, not funny. know you were the person behind it. That's me. I'm the man behind the curtain. Nice. That was uh, that was good work. It doesn't surprise I, me. If you put that out as an undergrad, it really doesn't surprise me that they reached out to you about it. This does great things for my ego. I appreciate that. <laughs> Excellent. So do you want to end the interview? Or you want to keep pushing forward? Yeah, no, I think we've peaked. Like we're good. We can just stop. Yeah, here. mine as well. Uh, no, the reason we brought you in, uh, we wanted to talk, you, talk to you a little bit today about the ketogenic diet. I understand examine.com. Uh, the, the, you have a new keto related, uh, is it an ebook that's com that's coming out? Yeah, essentially it's a, it's just a, it's a big 250 page, uh, guide. It uh, just came out this week. Um, it, it was called the, uh, evidence-based keto, your no hype guide to the ketogenic diet. Um, and honestly it was just born out of, um, talking to our readers and our followers and asking them like what was on their mind, what was their most burning questions that they wanted answered and uh, resoundingly came back that there was a ton of interest still in the ketogenic diet. And I think a lot of it just stems from confusion over the ketogenic diet. So for the past couple months, uh, we've been um, slogging through the research, trying to distill things down to their uh, practical concepts. And uh, that's culminated in this huge 250 page uh, guide to the ketogenic diet. And you said that became available this week. Um, we're recording right now, September 18th, 2019. Um, by the time this goes up, it might be like 2021, 2022, <laughs> but uh, just to give people a little timestamp on that. Uh, so by the time you're hearing this, the it, it is available. And so who who all was, was involved in the writing process here? Uh, just about everybody. I mean, we had three core uh, researchers and writers then we had a handful of other reviewers that would come in, and then we had a uh, copywriters and copy editors that came in after that um, to try to get this thing as dialed in as possible. Um, so pretty much everybody on the team had their hands on it at one point or another. Um, we had to pull in a couple of uh, experts as well when we couldn't agree on things to kind of uh, uh, get through some of the hairier research where the research was a little bit complicated. Um, but yeah, it was really a, a huge uh, team effort um, on our part. It's basically what it's, I mean, we've been doing nothing but this keto guide for the past couple months now. It's been kind of this nice, all-consuming project. If you don't mind us giving, or if you don't mind giving us kind of a look behind the scenes, what were 
some of the biggest things when writing this guide that you guys disagreed with and had to hammer out? Um, there was a point in the, uh, I believe it was the endurance section, um, where we were uh, discussing um, the methods which the studies were actually using to assess uh, endurance performance and which uh, type of assessment should we give the most uh, credence. So a little bit of uh, background on that would just would be, um, so the, there's a question of, uh, are the types of endurance tests being run actually in, the, in these studies actually translating to um, like real world scenarios? Gotcha. Um, and we actually brought in, we just, we, we honestly couldn't decide and we got stuck. So we just brought in an expert on, uh, um, on that front to help us just kind of get through the research because there was just so much and it was so deep. Um, at that point, um, you know, we were kind of hitting the, uh, the limits of our knowledge base. And so it was just more practical to bring in a, uh, an expert at that point and kind of help us, uh, kind of tease apart uh, some of the complicated nuances that we were running into for that question. No, I, I got you. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that was some, that was, that was a, like a 13,000 word discussion before we like <laughs> just punted and we're like, why don't we just bring in a, an expert on this? That makes sense. Now the ketogenic diet tends to be a, a pretty divisive topic as, as far as nutrition goes. Um, and people that aren't into fitness are like, how could a nutrition topic be divisive? But <laughs> keto finds a way. Uh, so and I would then, imagine. And then in four people in the nutrition area, if a topic isn't divisive, you're like, this is you're doing weird. it wrong. Yeah, th yeah, this this is odd. Like, <laughs> I'm sure that means this is what's going to cause a big blow up within the next 12 months because it's eerily quiet. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So I I'm I'm sure that's why a lot of your a lot of your readers, when you kind of put out the feelers and said, "What do you guys want to hear about?" I, I think that's probably why a lot of people said we've got an appetite for some keto related content. Was anyone in the writing? kind of in the writing room for exam do you have anyone involved that is like extremely pro keto um i wouldn't say there's anybody that's extremely pro keto or even against keto i mean our whole mo is kind of just we, we really try not to tell people what to do we try to just give them the information they might need to um, make those informed decisions for themselves um but as part of the uh, keto guide, everybody actually wrote down in the beginning of the guide their personal experiences with a ketogenic diet. Um, and even among the four or five people that actually wrote down their experiences, it's a wildly different experiences even between those five people. So we've all definitely like dabbled a bit in keto or experimented with it or tried it out for various like outcomes. But um, nobody currently is on the ketogenic diet to my knowledge. Yeah, so I that's, think that's, that's, our, that's our COI, I guess. Yeah, I, th I think it's important that um, that you guys at least had some kind of firsthand experience with it. I think it is a really uh, a really informative thing to do if you're going to write about keto to at least give it a shot and see what kind of challenges you run into, what what benefits you observe. Um, before we talk too much about your personal experience with it, I, I do want to go over keto in general. Um, you, you guys put all this information, really detailed information, into the guide, but I'm sure our listeners would like to at least get kind of a general overview uh, of what you guys uh, found as you looked into this research. So before we get too too far into the details, uh, how do you define a, a ketogenic diet? So the most basic definition is just uh, a ketogenic diet is literally just a diet that produces ketones. Um, and the way that you can achieve this is uh, primarily just through limiting your carb intakes, kind of the, uh, the general number that's... Uh, uh, out there on the internet is about less than 50 grams of carbs per day. There's still going to be a little bit of individual variability in that. But if uh, somebody is looking to do a ketogenic diet, that's the first step that they're going to need to take is to look at their carb intake and get it down to a sufficiently low level. And I, I guess before they even make that decision, there's got to be some kind of perceived benefit to, to making this pretty, I would say pretty drastic change to a modifying a typical, uh, standard diet. So what are the potential benefits of adopting a ketogenic diet? So there are some of the more well-known ones. The Probably the most well-known one is uh, for epilepsy, which is probably not going to apply to a ton of people. Um, but it has been used as a, a medical intervention therapy to help uh, reduce uh, seizure incidence and um, epileptics since uh, I think 1911 is when it first uh, kind of started to gain traction. 
Um, today it's more commonly used in uh, people with epilepsy who are also resistant to um, drug management. Um, so the other major benefit uh, people probably look to is uh, weight loss and then diabetes management are probably the other two more widely applicable um, topics that people try to, or that people might be inclined to use a ketogenic diet for. Um, and don't get me wrong, like they, they, they can both work for uh, either of these conditions. Like you can see right, uh, a good deal of weight loss um, when you go on a keto diet. You can see improvements in um, diabetes management when you go on a ketogenic diet. Um, so what we kind of uh, strove for, and the guide was saying, hey, like these are your options, but also consider what you're not doing, uh, your opportunity cost here uh, before you dive headfirst into this uh it is a pretty rigorous diet. I mean, just from uh, like personal experience, like there is a lot of, you have to pay a lot more attention to your diet than you would otherwise. Um, so yeah, like people can certainly uh, see uh, broad health benefits in the weight loss and diabetes categories primarily. Um, but it also, like to your point earlier, it's important that people kind of pause for a moment and consider like, what is it that I'm going to be changing in my lifestyle to actually accommodate this diet? Yeah, and, and full disclosure, I, I've done a, a pretty extended stretch of, of ketogenic dieting myself about about six or seven months. I've mentioned it on the show previously, so I've got a little bit of experience with it, and it's it's different. You know, it, it's not like uh, you know, it, it's a pretty pretty sizable change to your eating habits if you're eating a, a typical kind of you know Western diet, I guess you'd say. Um, now you mentioned earlier, I think you said like the general cutoff people throw around is like 50 grams of carbs a day. Was that mm -hmm. the number you threw out there? Um, yeah. is that a universal number for everybody? Is there a lot of variability there? Uh, there is a fair amount of variability there. I mean, even in, in the studies that are, uh, uh, gracious enough to give us the individual data, um, we do see a range in there and it, it, that's even the same with the, um, um, ketone uh, blood cutoff so to be quote unquote in ketosis your uh, ketone level in your blood uh, is supposed to be around uh, 0.5 or higher um, but even there there's going to be a wide uh, variability so somebody could be eating you know 50 grams of carbs and barely have any ketones in their blood and have to drop it down to 30 or 20 grams of carbs per day where somebody else might be eating 80 you know, or even possibly up to 100 if they're uh, targeting their carb intake around uh, exercise sessions and they might be over uh, one uh, uh, millimole uh, per liter of uh, ketones in their blood so um, there's going to be a wide a variety of responses even within these kind of general numbers that we're throwing out and one of the things that you hear a lot about when you when you look at people doing keto online and they're talking about putting their diet together um a lot of argument and debate about how much protein can really fit in the ketogenic diet because uh, certainly if you have excessive or you know if your protein intake gets too high that can eff effectively kick you out of ketosis right so this is actually one of the more surprising things that we uh kind of discovered and and doing this because i think like a lot of people i was under the impression that a higher protein intake might not uh, kick you out of ketosis but it might reduce the amount of ketones in your blood so it might reduce ketogenesis if your protein intake starts to creep up too high so um we extracted data from uh, 19 studies that actually tracked both blood ketones and uh protein intake and we had uh, two of our statisticians run through a couple of different models, and we really couldn't find any concrete association with blood ketone levels and protein intakes. So on a very general level, it does look like higher protein intake might reduce ketogenesis, but the extent is really super, super variable, even within the data that we were looking at. It was really, I mean, it was truly all over the place. I mean, we had people with um, protein intakes of 1.3 grams per day, um, who are at a, uh, blood ketone level of 0.33 millimoles and other people at a protein intake of 2.1 grams per day who are at 1.8 millimoles. So I think and that protein's that, in grams per kilogram body mass, yeah. right? Yep. Grams per kilogram of body mass. So I think even here, there's going to be a huge individual response. Um, I know that in, 
epileptic uh, ketogenic diets that they do monitor protein intake because um, I believe, uh, well, with a, with an epileptic, it's very important that they keep their blood ketone levels above a certain uh, level. Um, so I know there in practice, people do have reduced uh, protein intakes as well. But I think it's probably just going to be a, a matter of if this is something that's of concern for you, if you're somebody who wants to have a high ketone level, um, you're just going to have to do a little bit of uh, testing, you know, start with like a low protein intake, actually uh, measure your blood ketone levels and then ramp it up over time and see if it's actually affecting you personally. Because right now the averages are are just too disparate to kind of give any practical advice on what, you know, gram per kilogram of, of body weight protein intake might reduce ketogenesis. And if I'm a person who's trying keto and I want to, if I want to do some experimentation with my protein intake, how do I know if I'm in a state of ketosis? So if you're looking to actually uh, truly measure your um, uh, blood ketone levels, there's three ways to do it objectively. You can measure it in blood with a meter. Um, there are now these pretty nifty uh, breath monitors um, that you can just breathe into. Um, and uh, there's the tried and true urine strips. Uh, the blood ketone measurements are probably going to give you the most accurate measure with breath being second and the urine tests giving you uh, not an indication of what's immediately happening in your body, but way of what might have happened a couple hours ago, where the blood measure is going to give you the most uh, immediate up to the information about what's going on in your body like in the moment. So if you're looking to see how your protein intake might affect ketogenesis or even your carb intake, if you want to mess around with how many grams of carbs you can get away with in a day before your ketone levels start to drop, you would probably need to go with uh, blood for the best, um, uh, more, more, most accurate measurements, but you can probably get away with um, the urine test strips if uh, you're not inclined to go out and buy the meter and the blood test strips for the ketones because they tend to be pretty expensive. And what, what if somebody is, they're not trying to do like a really granular kind of self-experimentation approach. What if they just kind of go on what they perceive to be a keto diet and they just want to generally know, like, does it seem like I'm in keto? Are there any uh, less objective ways that a, a person might be able to figure that out? Yeah, like less objectively, uh, some people do get uh, uh, keto breath, which is the, the acetone, the ketone acetone. So when it's excreted in your breath, it can produce this odor that's kind of been described as uh, like nail polish remover or slightly fruity. Um, but this is something that doesn't tend to stick around. It might be something that happens when you initially go on the keto diet for the first weeks, but then it might disappear. So it's kind of a so-so, um, somewhat objective measure. Um, interestingly, there are some people who have said that they can subjectively feel like when they are in ketosis, um, which seems like somewhat plausible, um, but it's also going to vary greatly from person to person. So um, like you would just have to like, if, if, if there's somebody out there who just kind of is like moderately interested in what they're like, you know, if they're actually like, truly in ketosis, I would maybe just go pick up the urine strips, which are like, very cheap. I think you can get like 50 for 10 bucks normally. Um, just test it out a few times or here and there um, on a more casual schedule just to as a spot check to see you know what your body is doing. Before we move on from determining if you're in ketosis, I do have one slightly technical question. Um, sure. It's something that's kind of, I, I, I've kicked around the idea for a while or I've, I've wrestled with the idea for a while. But if you read on message boards and stuff like that, people will, some people will indicate that the more they were on a ketogenic diet, even without significant changes to the diet, over time their measured ketone levels seem to be going down. And people have talked about whether or not that means that maybe they are creating less ketones because they're utilizing more fatty acids for fuel. I've seen people indicate that they think because they're more adapted to metabolize ketones that they're just clearing ketones more rapidly from their blood. Is there any mm -hmm. merit to those uh, to those contentions? And, and then, of course, there's also the possibility that their adherence just slips slightly over time. Sure. Right. Yeah. So that's the that's the kicker, right? So, like, is it that they're processing ketones more efficiently, and therefore their body isn't producing as many of them, or is it just that their adherence is dropping over time? And how do you even tease those two apart? Um, I don't think we really have any really good uh, long-term data or even moderately long-term data on that. Um, there is some short-term metabolic ward studies that indicate 
um, that once uh, ketone levels hit a certain threshold, they kind of plateau. They don't tend to uh, decrease, but even even then, we're only talking about a month of data. Um, the second uh, study type that you could look at to try to answer that question is uh, fasting, where people are just going on very long extended fasts. And in those day, in those uh, studies, you do see um, the ketone level not uh, decrease, but even increase over time. But again, that isn't exactly um, what people on long-term ketogenic diets are doing. So it's kind of hard to say what's actually happening. Um, we do see in uh, long-term keto trials that are actually monitoring uh, carb intake and are doing some sort of measurement on uh, blood ketone levels that we do tend to see on average an increase in carbs over time um, and a decrease in those blood ketone measures over time. So if I had to take a guess, I would say that for the majority of people, it's probably going to be that their carb intake might be increasing. But I mean, I can't, I, I can't fully exclude that. It, yeah, like your body might just be adapting better uh, to those ketones and then you might see a drop um, if you're doing this years at a time as opposed to like a couple of months that you might see in some of these studies. That makes sense. I, I do have one additional technical question. I kind of lied. So <laughs> when people adopt these ketogenic diets, typically what you see is that, I mean, fat will make up what, 70, 80% of the calories coming in, something like that? Yeah, usually north of 60. So from a theoretical perspective, do you really need to have that much fat in the diet or is, is the real, I mean, so like if you were just going to go really extreme with it and just restrict your carbs super hard and keep your, I mean, it, it sounds like protein doesn't need to be in a super tight range. Could you just kind of do like a protein sparing modified fast and still have some kind of keto adaptation going on as long as your carbs are low? Yeah, I think you you possibly could. And it'd actually be very interesting to see a study where they tanked the uh, the carb intake, but then they jacked the protein intake to up to like, you know, three or uh, three grams per kilogram of body weight or higher just to see um, what that would actually do um, to the production of uh, ketones. But yeah, like in theory, I think that's that's entirely possible. And it also gets back to what the main goal of you going on like the ketogenic diet is. Like, are you like chasing those ketones or those ketones something that you want or is it just the eating pattern that you know appeals to you that you can maintain better and the ketones are kind of not as important as uh, the overall eating style but yeah i could i could definitely see a um, a scenario where that might be the case that was actually a, a really perfect transition in your answer there you mentioned it you know you have to consider or some sometimes it's important to people like what fits their eating preferences um now w when we do studies like this in the research, what do attrition rates look like? I mean, do, do people, when subjects are randomly assigned to this diet, do they tend to adhere to it and, and enjoy it somewhat well? Well, there's a, there's two components to that question. One's the, the, the dropout rate and then one's the adherence rate. So the dropout rate is those people who fully left the study, they abandoned it, they quit. Um, the adherence rate might be those who are still in the study. They stick it out to the very end but whether they were truly eating keto or not might be kind of up for question. So there is uh, an unpublished meta-analysis that looked at this, it looked at uh, 30 keto studies, uh, over 1,000 participants, and found the average dropout rate uh, to be similar for uh, low-calorie uh, keto diets and low-calorie non-keto diets. So in, in both cases, everybody was on a, like a calorie-restricted diet. It was about 24% for both groups, no big difference. Um, there have been some interesting long-term studies that are not necessarily keto, but kind of get at this question of um, uh, dropout rates. Uh, one of them was the Framingham uh, State uh, Food Study, uh, where people were divided into three groups, high carb, moderate, uh, low carb. Um, again, the dropout rate was uh, about the same between the groups, around 26% per group. Um, but one of the more, I think, informative studies on this question was, again, not except a, a keto study, but um, started off in the keto uh, carb range. It was the uh, Diet Fits study that came out uh, in early 2018 um, that had, it was a huge trial. It was 608 participants, half were randomized to low carb and half were randomized to uh, low fat. But one thing they did differently than most studies is that when they randomized 300 participants to low carb, 
they actually started them out at 20 grams of carbs per day for the first two months of the year-long trial. Um, and they were told after this period that you can either stay at this very low carb level or you can increase your carb intake to a they were uh, to the minimum level that you felt was sustainable. So three months into the study, the average carb intake was already up to around 100 grams per day. And when you looked at the people who were still reporting ketogenic levels of carb intakes, um, they were also reporting unrealistically low calorie intakes. Um, so there was some question of uh, the veracity of whether they were truly like, ketogenic or not. But on the whole, even when uh, people were randomly assigned to these uh, this initially low-carb diet, um, nobody opted to... Um, sustain that over the 12 month uh, trial. Um, but then you have to juxtapose that with people who might be in a study who chose keto or opted into keto, who might have a higher um, dropout and adherence rate. So let's say uh, a person figures out how to do a, you know, a solid keto diet that works for them. Their adherence is good. They're loving it. What are the potential drawbacks of adopting a ketogenic diet uh, as kind of a long-term diet solution? Well, it really just depends on their individual preferences and their individual um, medical considerations. Um, one that is universally true regardless of um, either of these is uh, you have to pay attention to your micronutrient intake. Um, any diet, including keto, that restricts a lot of foods or food groups you're going to naturally increase your potential risk of under-consuming um, vitamin and minerals and hitting those requirements. Um, so this is one consideration that you have to think about when you're switching over to a ketogenic diet is that the amount of effort that's going to go into planning to make sure that you are actually hitting these things um, is going to go up. So your, your time requirement and your meal prepping, you're going to have to do a little bit more research than you might be uh, uh, comfortable with or used to in order to make sure that you're not getting horribly deficient in, in any one uh, vitamin or mineral. Um, you could go the multivitamin route if it's something that you don't want to you know, think about. You just kind of want to um, use a, a general band-aid to make sure that you're hitting all your um, vitamin and mineral needs. But even there, you're going to have to put in some amount of research to make sure that you're getting an appropriate multivitamin that is well formulated because the formulas for multivitamins are all over the place. So you make sure you really want to make sure that you're getting one that's been like well developed. It's actually going to suit uh, your needs as a ketogenic dieter. Yeah, I noticed in the in the guide that you provided some guidance for finding a, a decent multivitamin supplement, but it really seems like that might be the route to go. I mean, some of the micronutrient gaps that you guys identified, I mean, we're talking calcium, fiber, iodine, iron, magnesium, potassium, sodium, vitamin A, B1, B9, C, D. That's a lot to supplement individually. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, certainly yeah. not. you're not going to be defic deficient in every single one of those, but th there is a pretty, a pretty long list of potential uh, insufficiencies with the diet. Yeah. And like one thing um, that's important to communicate from our end is that we are playing the odds here, right? So like when we're talking about these nutrient deficiencies, we're talking about, or not even the deficiencies, but possibly inadequacies. Right. Um, we're talking, we're playing the averages here, right? Like we're looking at studies, we're seeing what on average uh, has changed to vitamin and mineral intakes um, just in general. And like, here are the ones that like you should look out for, but it might not happen with your specific ketogenic diet. It really just depends on how your individual diet is formulated. So it might be uh, beneficial to track it um, for a bit just to see if you are going to be uh, deficient in um, any of these. But uh, again, that's going to take a lot of time and effort. And if you're somebody who's just like, I'm just going to, you know, this is like, this is too much effort. This is getting too nerdy for me then a multivitamin uh, might be a, a decent option for you. If you're just somebody who wants to make sure that you're kind of like hitting all your bases, um, you just, you know, you put in the effort one time to research a really good multivitamin, and then you kind of can coast on that for the duration of your diet, maybe with some check-ins down the road. Yeah. So eventually in this conversation, we'll get to the good stuff. We'll talk weight loss and performance, but before we get there, there are a couple other things that I, I often hear about as potential drawbacks that I'd, I'd like to get your input on, but sometimes you hear that keto is associated with potentially unfavorable changes in blood lipids and also potentially, I've heard some people say hair loss. Um, yeah. any, any, any evidence to support uh, either of those claims? 
So the blood lipids, we actually do have some good data on what's uh, what's going on there long term. Um, so uh, a big uh, ketogenic diet study, the Verda Health Study, had just recently published their two-year results. So in this study, they had about 300 uh, individuals with diabetes on a ketogenic diet. It was a very intensive program. There was lots of monitoring. There was lots of follow-up. Um, there was lots of... Uh, um, support in place to make sure that these people were actually adhering to the ketogenic diet. So at the end of the two-year mark, um, they did see a sustained drop in triglycerides, uh, a sustained uh, small increase in uh, high-density lipoproteins, HDL, and they also saw a sustained increase in low-density lipoproteins, or LDL. So there is an open question of what this actually means in the face of and other improved biomarkers, right? So these people in this study, they lost a ton of weight. Uh, I think the average weight loss was uh, 11 kilograms. Um, and they had a ton of other health markers improve across the board. So um, there's kind of a question of, well, does this actually matter? Like, does this uh, increase in LDL actually matter, like given what else is uh, happening uh, to these people's metabolic profiles? So it this kind of also comes down to your own personal risk threshold, right? Like for me, I tend to be pretty cautious. So if I was on a ketogenic diet and I did see my LDL go up, I would probably take measures to try to get that down, you know, increase more fibrous vegetables in my diet, maybe use a fiber supplement to help keep that uh, LDL um, or to, to help drop that LDL. Um, but this is uh, also a, a place in the guide where we recommend that people go talk to their doctor about this, especially if they have a history of heart disease or elevated uh, cholesterol profiles. And it doesn't hurt to get a baseline either before you even start this diet to, so you can actually have some data to track and see what's actually happening like to your blood lipids over time. Because some people are totally fine. Some people, their blood lipids across the board will improve. And it all comes down again to that individual formulation of, of how you are executing the ketogenic diet. Yeah, this is one of those areas where keto is kind of a tough sell for me because in, in the context of a, a fairly typical diet, I, I think we have a generally pretty good idea of how our different cardiometabolic risk factors relate to certain aspects of, of diet. And so like you, you could, without, I guess, outside of the framework of keto, you could design a cardiovascular oriented diet that you feel really confident about. And so for me with keto, when you get to this thing where it's like, well, some of the markers look better, some don't look better, what's the net effect of that? The mm -hmm. uncertainty there for me, I think, is kind of a tough sell when you juxtapose it with more traditional diets where I feel like we've, we don't have a perfect under, perfect understanding, but we're, we're at least, I think, in the ballpark of what a heart healthy diet looks like. Yeah, it's, we actually even posed this question on a, like, uh, on the for the thousand foot level um, in one of the sections where we talk about, you know, should you even go on a ketogenic diet? And it's always, you know, compared to what, like what else would you be doing if you weren't on a ketogenic diet or what else is out there? Like what's your opportunity cost? So we took the example of um, the Mediterranean diet, right? So it's uh, Mediterranean diet is, has way more studies out there. Um, they have very long-term trials about the Mediterranean diet. So you have more information about the risks and benefits of a Mediterranean diet compared to a ketogenic diet where there aren't as many studies and there certainly aren't as many long-term studies um, about uh, what's going on, on a, uh, for your long-term health on a keto diet. So if you're somebody whose personal risk threshold is a little bit uh, higher, um, you might be the one who opts for the more well-studied, the more well-understood diet, um, such as a Mediterranean-style diet. Um, but there's going to be other people out there who are saying, hey, you know what, like the, I, I understand the risks. Um, I still think it's going to be worth it for my individual you know, circumstances, so I'm still going to give it a go. So that's really what we're trying to do with this guide is just give people the information they need to decide, you know, what do I want to do like for myself and hopefully they discuss it with their um, healthcare provider or a dietitian if they need to, if, they're, if they have um, uh, medical conditions they have to actually take under consideration as well. Now, on the topic of individual differences and preferences, one thing, that you, one, one thing that you see a lot just in the general online discussion of ketogenic diets is there's some people like in the ketosphere who just fucking love it. 
Um, you know, not just they think that it's the best way to eat, but, you know, they have anecdotes like, I tried this and instantly my entire life got better. My energy levels were better. My sleep was better. Everything is awesome. I love this diet so much. And then other people give keto a shot and it's literally the exact opposite story. Like energy levels tank. I'm now having sleep problems. Um, I hate literally everything about this diet. So, I mean, some of that might just be like psychosomatic just based on how well they expect the diet to go going into it. But do we know, do we know anything about like physiologically, are there predictors of whether people will take well to the ketogenic diet or not? I mean, I wish that'd be amazing. (laughs) Um, I, I, not that I've seen, um, we did dig into a few of the, the we didn't have one for keto, but there was uh, one uh, trial that we looked at that examined um, could genetics predict who might be a better candidate for weight loss on a low carb versus a low fat diet, not a ketogenic diet, but a low carb diet. Um, and at least with, this was also the diet fit study, um, at least with their 600 um, participants in there and the uh, genes they actually looked at, uh, those couldn't even predict who might be better at um, losing weight on a given diet. It doesn't mean to say that we can't get there, but I think it's going to be a lot harder than um, people tend to think it might be uh, just because of the way that I think genetics has been kind of sold um, at large as kind of this wondrous, you know, like you can, your genes can tell you exactly what to do down to like a very precise, um, you know, regimen. And um, I don't think we're, especially with diet, we're just not there yet. There are certainly areas within diet that um, we can be like, uh, like like caffeine and genetics, caffeine metabolism and genetics. Um, But um, with keto response and genetics, no, I think that's, that's, probably uh that's probably a little far off but it'll be super cool when it when it arrives no i i feel you i think uh i think people discovered the gene for sickle cell and the gene for huntington and they're like oh shit this is easy like just find yeah. the one thing that's find off and the gene yeah predict this but yeah you're you're right like everything else is a lot more complicated and i i wouldn't expect us to know like genetically what's going on but i was wondering if there were just you know other measures or biomarkers but yeah sounds like there's not that's actually part of one of the uh, kind of the unknown areas is like the long term because when people debate about oh like what is like keto adaptation like when does it actually happen like one of the more unknown areas is the long term effects of uh, this on uh, various hormones and and, uh, and and so I mean I think that's going to be an open question for a while just because that takes a lot of money to fund a study that would actually look at that uh, in mass for an appreciable amount of time. No, I I got gotcha. you. Okay. Now, one one point to clarify. Um, we've talked a little bit about carbohydrate intakes thus far. Is it safe for listeners to assume that we're talking about net carbohydrate? Yeah. So this is actually one of the things that we recommend in the guide is that as opposed to counting uh, total carbohydrate, which would include fiber, is that you just count your net carbohydrate, which is uh, basically the car- the total carbohydrate content minus the fiber content. Um, I think this has a couple of advantages. Um, primarily, the first advantage would be you're going to get a little bit more flexibility in what you can eat in a day because, you know, 50 grams of carbs a day is not a lot. Um, and you it really is an allowance for your day. And uh, if by counting, by excluding uh, the fiber that you're uh, taking in, you're going to free up your diet a little bit uh, to be a little bit more lenient in how many and what types of foods you can actually eat before you hit your personal carb threshold for the day, whatever that might be. Um, the second benefit is that you're actually probably going to get more total fiber intake doing it this way as well. Um, fiber intake was one of those uh, nutrients of concern, which tends to be under-consumed on uh, low-carb or ketogenic diets. So at least from our perspective, we think it's a pretty good way to go because you're possibly getting a little bit more food flexibility. You're possibly getting a little bit more fiber and uh, uh, possibly a little bit more um, uh, other nutrients by um, excluding that fiber from your total uh, carb intake. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, for the listeners who have been patiently waiting, we've hammered out all the stuff to make sure that you would actually survive a keto diet. I think, yeah. I think we've talked Step about one. pretty pretty objective pros and cons or you know potential benefits, potential uh, downsides. Now we're going to get into the good stuff. So we're talking fat loss, muscle retention, and performance. So 
first looking at the body comp side of things. I'm sure that that was a, a key focus of, of the research you did on the diet. How does keto stack up to a more traditional carbohydrate intake when it comes to fat loss, muscle gain, or muscle retention during fat loss? Yeah, so this is probably one of the most contentious areas of um, the keto diet online, at least in the online sphere. Um, and consequently, I think this was, a, was our longest chapter as well. I think uh, uh, this was a, like a 50-page chapter that we dedicated uh, just to these topics um, because they're so contentious and because the data is so mixed on this. Um, so one of the things that we did is when we're looking at <clears throat> body composition on a keto diet, is that we looked at studies with keto with prescribed exercise and uh, people who were on a ketogenic diet where uh, exercise was not explicitly prescribed by um, the authors. So in the uh, ketogenic diets that had prescribed exercise, we even limited it to those trials that were uh, controlled trials where there was even exercise prescription between groups where the blood and urine ketones were uh, measured so we could have, have some objective measure of if they were actually following the keto diet or not. Um, and they had to have a, uh, an objective assessment of body composition such as DEXA or bioelectrical impedance, BIA. Um, so these were kind of the main four things that we looked for. And we turned out uh, 10 studies that actually met this inclusion criteria. It lasted anywhere from about uh, 6 to 12 weeks. So uh, pretty good in terms of a, a training study. There was a couple of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12-week training studies in there, so it was pretty good. The trouble came in trying to figure out if the reported measurements um, in fat loss and lean mass change seen were actually real. So there's an issue with using DEXA and BIA measures um, on ketogenic dieters because when people go on a ketogenic diet, they tend to lose a lot of water weight and they tend to lose a lot of stored carbohydrate in the form of glycogen. And this can really mess with um, these measurements, these DEXA measurements, these body composition measurements. So this is actually one of the things that we really struggled with is like, what is the practical takeaway of the data that we're seeing in these body composition changes given the potential measurement error that we know is going to be uh, in some of these studies. So instead of kind of like drilling down and giving you exact numbers and saying, hey, like here is exactly, you know, how much like fat loss uh, or fat you might lose or muscle you might gain on a ketogenic diet, I think the best that we could do with the data that was there was uh, show you what trends that we saw in those studies, in those ketogenic diet studies, where lean mass was either preserved or increased and where fat loss was maximized. And uh, the results will not be surprising to any listeners of this podcast. Uh, the trends that we saw were that those who did the best on the ketogenic diet in terms of body composition changes were those that had high daily protein intakes between 1.6 and 2.3 grams per kilogram of body weight. They had very good uh, levels of exercise volume and intensities within their prescribed exercise program. And their caloric intake levels did not create drastic caloric deficits so as to uh, hopefully better preserve um, muscle mass. So, I mean, bottom line is that we just, you need more studies uh, that take steps to reduce the body composition measurement errors that are in, introduced by these sudden shifts in hydration status and stored glycogen status. Um, and that is the type of study that we would need to actually see if... Um, on a granular level, like a ketogenic diet, uh, or how on a granular level, the ketogenic diet is affecting these uh, lean mass and fat mass changes um, while undertaking exercise. But I mean, for now, the best we got are trends. So that's what we were able to report. Yeah. What, what about in comparison to a, a more typical non-keto diet? Did, did, did you see any trend indicating that it was any more or less favorable when it came to body composition outcomes? No, not really. Um, uh, the ones that we uh, extracted, uh, the 10 studies that we saw were pretty, uh, um, they tended to be fairly evenly matched. And we even looked at a couple of subgroups um, where we thought that training status, protein and and, uh, and other, well, mostly protein and, and uh, training status were evenly matched between the two groups. And even there, um, like it was hard to say um, just because of the measurement errors that we were seeing. Um, but we did not see 
huge differences between the two. So there, if there is, I, well, this is, this is me hypothesizing right now, you know? So like if there are actually meaningful differences between the two, uh, uh, training modalities, either training on keto or training on non keto, I suspect they're probably going to be, uh, relatively small, at least for body composition, all things being equal. I'm glad that you guys didn't over interpret, you know, little fluctuations in those body comp measurements. Uh, you know, I've, I've done about a billion body comp tests in my life. And, and it always kills me when somebody over interprets a small study and says like, well, the one group lost 1.5 kilos, but the other group lost 1.8. So at least it's leaning in that. It's like, no, that's not leaning anywhere. <laughs> like you, yeah. you, you yeah, got seven yeah. people in each group. That's, that is absolutely nothing. Yeah. That, that 0.3 kilos is like one eighth of the measurement error. Yeah, this is this is one of those sections that I actually rewrote this three different times just because we were literally struggling to get useful information out of it, given, you know, the amount of uh, measurement error that is probably in these results anyway. I mean, and that doesn't even get into like the differences between like, you know, the errors that you can see when you're comparing a different DEXA machine using a different um uh, algorithm that uses different underlying assumptions um, between studies because i've i mean one of the things that i would like to see in these studies is that they actually report the dexa machine that they're using the software version that they're using and the algorithm that they used because each has different underlying assumptions that can really change the way that we're going to compare these studies so like really all we were left with at least for these types of studies and the it was just trends and general overall arching trends we couldn't really drill down much more than that because then it's just going to get there's too much error involved at that point yeah so switching gears what about uh when you know a lot of times people switch to keto some people say it totally tanks their performance some people say that it just you know was a game changer now they're performing way better what does the research say about keto as it pertains to physical performance so this was actually this is what happened to me when I went on keto. I I was one of the ones who did not recover. Uh, my, I was not able to recover my exercise performance until I fully cycled off of it. Even by the end of the second month, um, I was still feeling pretty like gassed by the end of um, higher intensity workouts. Um, overall, uh, with the the data we have on uh, strength, um, and again, we don't have. Uh, you know, the perfect study on this, right? Like, so ideally you'd have um, a study that has a keto group and a control group. Both are undergoing the same exercise regimen, like monitored and like prescribed by the research staff. They're getting their meals or they're at least being tested uh, for blood ketones and they're measuring strength and blood ketones at different time points. So you can measure the change in strength of the keto group compared to a non-keto group. But alas, this does not exist. So we're left with, a handful of uh, studies, um, imperfect as they may be, to try to get at this answer. Um, so at least on a strength, um, uh, or looking just at uh, the strength uh, metric, it does not look like the ketogenic diets hinder or enhance strength performance or gains. Um, but again, we're looking at a limited number of, of imperfect, usually short-term studies. Um, so you can even take that with a grain of salt. So then we have to kind of back up a little bit and look at underlying biochemical mechanisms. So um, my best or our best guess really is that if you are um, really looking to absolutely maximize muscle strength and muscle gain, you're probably better off on a higher carbohydrate diet. And that might even be in the low carbohydrate range. So you might only be consuming, you know, 100 plus uh, grams of carbs a day. Um, but for everybody else where this is not like the absolute most critical part of it, like they're going to be fine. Like you're not like severely hurting um, your muscle gains. You're probably not going to be severely improving them either. But um, if the ketogenic diet is something that you find works for you and works for you well, this is probably not something you need to worry about, or at least that most people don't need to worry about. You mentioned that when it came when it came to the cardio performance, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, you had to bring in an yeah. expert. What what exactly was the uh, the source of confusion when it came to the endurance type exercise outcomes? So in endurance uh, studies, there's usually three ways to assess, or there's three commonly used ways to assess 
endurance performance. You can measure time to completion for a set distance. So if you run the same distance in less time, your endurance performance has improved. You can measure distance covered in a set time. So if you run a little bit faster in the same amount of time, we can say that your endurance performance has improved. Or you can measure time to exhaustion at a set pace. Um, so if you run longer or run further at a set pace, your endurance has also improved. So the, so the um, debate was over the intersection between these measurements and the VO2 max that they were being measured at. Um, and whether that is an appreciable difference between like a recreational runner versus a, uh, a professional level uh, endurance runner, right? Um, <clears throat> so for this one was a little bit more easy to uh, actually, um, or at least with more confidence, we can say that it does look like a low carbohydrate diet would impair your endurance performance at the elite level. It might not matter at, as much on the recreational level, just again, depending on your individual preferences. But if you are an elite athlete to where um, performance uh, absolutely matters and it is the most important thing to you, then uh, even uh, a keto adapted athlete, the odds are that it will probably not help. But again, um, I, we can't conclusively say that it, it might not for everyone. Like there might be somebody out there who this does actually help for their particular set of circumstances. Um, so we we're, we're pretty careful to kind of convey that uh, in this section because I don't want people coming away with the idea that keto hurts all endurance performance in all scenarios because it just might not matter depending, depending on your uh, set of circumstances. There might be people who, who are just like, hey, like I enjoy going on like really long hikes on the weekend and I like to do like day hikes and I just like I don't want to eat so there might be a uh, an advantage to that these like very low intensity levels where they might be able to keep going without feeling hungry do, do we know how keto affects lactate threshold levels um it's not something that I, I don't think we actually looked into that for this version um I, oh you know what no actually we so Initially, there was a, a huge uh, biochemical chapter that we were going to write mm -hmm. um, that we ended up uh, uh, we're probably saving it for the update of this just because it got it got super nerdy. Uh, it was real nerdy, and so we were gonna we, we set that one aside for um, version two of uh, the keto the keto guide. I, I got you. W one of the arguments that I've heard before is that um, maybe keto decreases VO two max but increases both relative and absolute lactate threshold. So for like uh, okay. really long duration stuff, it could be beneficial. So I, I was just wondering if, if you guys had looked into that at all. So like they're really like really long in terms of like, you know, like the hundred mile, like the multiple day long races, like that kind of event. Yeah. So the, the exact context of this is we mentioned keto on the podcast. Oh, maybe three or four weeks ago. And it was, we recorded this before Zach Bitter broke the 100 mile track world record. Um, yeah. And then the it was released after he did that. And there were a couple people who commented on the episode and was like, oh no, like Zach Bitter, he's this low carb runner and he just broke the world record. You guys are full of shit. Um, <laughs> do, do, do well, you, they're right. Do you follow uh, Zach Bitter at all and, and know anything about that? I've heard the name bantered around, you know, internet forums, but it's not something I've followed. No, Greg, didn't you say that he um, he kind of takes a cyclical approach to his his low carb intakes? I mean, so basically, it seems like he matches his carbohydrate intake to the amount to the intensity of the training that he's doing. So he might be in keto or very close to keto um, when he's in a phase of his training that he's doing like longer duration, lower intensity type stuff. And then when he's doing um, like more high intensity training, he'll eat more carbs during those phases of training or during the days of his training where intensity is going to be higher. And and so I think his, um, like I think his total carb intake throughout an entire year and even for the higher intensity work that he does is probably still lower than most ultra runners. Um but it's not, I don't know, in terms of like a general sense, it's not incredibly low carb, at least through most of the year. And it's certainly not keto, it, except maybe for like the really, really like low intensity stuff. So he's doing more of a like a targeted low carb approach. Yeah, pretty much. Okay.
So I want to make sure that we have a nice little uh, concise summary statement here to make sure that we, uh, we're all on the same page. So it sounds like when you look at the, the keto research, theoretically, it can do just as well for fat loss um, and potentially even attempts at muscle gain, but there's no inherent advantage. Does that sound to be? Yeah, on the whole, on the whole I think that's what most people are probably going to experience. And on the endurance front for most uh, endurance activities that aren't like super ultra low intensity, it would also appear uh, for those types of activities that there might actually be an impairment from keto. Is that accurate? Yeah. The studies that we looked at, you know, along the spectrum of intensities, like generally speaking, you're either going to see no improvement or potential detriment just where you are along that spectrum. And then finally, for strength-related outcomes, the research currently shows that it's approximately as good, but I would contend that the higher your rep ranges get, the more likely that you might suffer some degree of impairment. I'm not going to put those words in your mouth, though. Do you think think that's generally pretty accurate? I mean, it's entirely possible just because looking at the types of uh, resistance training programs that these people were undertaking on the ketogenic diet, for the most part, they were pretty modest. So I don't. Th- I think there was maybe one that like really pushed them into the higher rep range, and and that is the one that did see um, like better preservation of lean mass um, and stuff like that. But yeah, it's entirely possible. It's just it's just one of those things that you know we're just we're kind of handicapped by the research that's available to us now, which tends to be like a decently uh, formulated but still moderate volume uh, uh, resistance training programs. Yeah, I mean, my experience with keto is really similar to yours, where uh, I I did it for a good six or seven months. Um, My workouts, I kind of had that idea in my head, like, oh, if I just hang in there, surely it'll come around. I tend to do higher rep stuff generally on pretty high volume programs that are oriented toward hypertrophy. And my my performance just never came around. And after six or seven months, it's like, hey, if it ain't here yet, (laughs) it's it's, it's just not coming. Um, you just weren't keto adapted. I know. It's like, I, I, the, I swear if I would have like posted that and been like, this keto stuff's BS, somebody w- would have been like, dude, the magic happens in month eight. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe you cut bait early. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole keto adaptation thing is a very interesting uh, debate. And it's one that we looked into when we were uh, writing this guide is because there isn't really a well-defined, you know, like cutoff that everybody actually agrees on. And there's so many possible metrics that you can look at too. And there's so many possible metrics that just haven't been studied, like the hormonal changes over like long term. So it is kind of a, you know, a shoulder shrug at this point and be like, maybe, maybe not, but it'd be interesting to see if, uh, in the, you know, in upcoming years, if people can kind of get around a, a central definition of what exactly is keto adaptation. Cause at this point it doesn't seem like, you know, everybody disagrees on, you know, what the best uh, possible metric for that is. Yeah, in some circles, it seems to be kind of a a mythical ideal, but uh, you know, I, I do want to be clear. I, I have really, really don't have any major issues with the keto diet in certain contexts, but the only thing I ever get annoyed with is just the like extremely overzealous people who push it for every possible circumstance and and say like, oh, it's this magical kind of diet that's hacking all these different systems of the body, and it's like that just doesn't seem to to line up with any evidence that we have aside from the people who insist upon it. There was actually a ton of interest on like topics like that. Like when we were surveying our, our readers, I mean, we got requests for, you know, can keto treat Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, migraines, Lou Gehrig's, Parkinson's, like to the point where we literally just dedicated an entire chapter called can keto treat dot, 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 (laughs) just to summarize the research on all these, like these tons of, uh, uh, endpoints that people are are interested in, or have they've heard that, hey, like, oh, I, you know, my, you know, my grandfather's doing keto for Alzheimer's. Like, what's the research? So we just we wanted to make sure that we kind of covered that as well because I know that that is a extremely like hot area where again there is just isn't a lot of research, so it's ripe for you know exaggeration. D- does it seem like it can treat anything that would surprise people? Um, migraines was probably the most surprising thing to me. Um, again, there is not 
a lot of research here. There is two clinical trials I could find. One was a um, it was a small trial with 18 subjects, and they did see a reduced uh, um, migraine frequency on a keto diet after one month. Um, but the second study was actually more interesting to me because of the way that they set it up. It was um, it was a larger trial, so there was uh, 96 females uh, um, who were randomly assigned to either receive a standard low calorie, like very low calorie diet for six months, or a very uh, low calorie ketogenic diet. Um, for one month, followed by five months of the standard um, low calorie diet. So group one is just on a, your normal like calorie restricted diet. Group two goes very low calorie keto for one month and then does the standard low calorie for the next five months. But in that one month, uh, the keto group saw a huge drop in both uh, migraine attack frequency and days with headaches. And it like almost rebounded back to baseline when they went back to the standard low calorie, higher carb diet. Um, like both groups overall saw um, reductions in migraines. So that might be some uh, weight loss interaction there. But like in the keto group, the graph just looks like this big check mark where it just like plummets from the our keto and just bounces all the way back up when they're um, when they're on the standard uh, uh, higher cal or higher carb diet. So. That would be that wouldn't surprise me, and I'd definitely be interested to see um, if anybody follows up on that research in the future. That's pretty wild because I I had not heard that before, and it, it's one of those things where a lot of times, like headaches affect so many people that yeah. that one would think like, hey, if there, if there's a dietary intervention that can do something about this, that's something that like the keto folks would be shouting from the rooftops, like, hey, you guys trying to like lose weight get better, perform like a fucking caveman, and not have <laughs> headaches anymore, you should do this diet. But it, yeah, that, that's weird that that's something that's not publicized more if if that seems like a possible benefit. Yeah, I think this is maybe just like got slipped under the radar because there's literally two studies on this. But yeah, if this is not something that I've heard um, amongst any of the, the keto groups that frequently at least. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, I thought that was yeah, I thought it was super interesting because I'm sure somebody out there with a migraine might be say, hey, you know, like maybe I will try the ketogenic diet and see what happens. So we we've got definitely certain forms of epilepsy, potentially migraines based on limited evidence. Were there any other medical conditions that you thought like, you know, the, the evidence looks like it's at least leaning towards some some potential? I mean, I would cautiously say maybe some certain types of brain cancers in certain circumstances. Um, so there is uh, uh, research on uh, keto and uh, brain cancer. At least it seems that like brain cancer is the area that's gained the most traction in terms of um, can a ketogenic diet help as an uh, add-on therapy um, like uh, for select types of brain cancers. And there's a decent amount of preclinical evidence from cancer cells and animal models indicating that, hey, like this might do something. Um, but uh, the research now, honestly, is just one, it's all over the place. <laughs> um, it's pretty low quality. Um, and the human evidence that we have is pretty sparse. And most of these are designed as limited case studies or open label trials that are primarily testing, uh, is this a safe diet to put these people on? So the secondary endpoints are usually, hey, did this do anything to the cancer? But right now they seem to be in the space of we're just going to make sure that this doesn't, that this is actually safe for them and that it doesn't make it worse. Um, but even in the limited studies that we have, you see huge um, dropout rates. You're talking about 50% or higher. Um, so, it, you know, even if it does do something, like, can you actually get these patients to adhere to it long enough to, like, to matter? Um, there was one uh, study or there's one a systematic review that found out of 330 participants, only 20% were even able to adhere well to it. Ooh. There was tons of complaints about fatigue, dehydration, gastrointestinal upset. Uh, you know, they're dealing with a very restrictive diet on top of everything that um, a cancer diagnosis, you know, puts on your on your plate to deal with. Um, and even the analyses that were performed on tumor progression are again, like very highly mixed. So like generally speaking, it seems that like there might be something here down the road for very specific cases, but it certainly doesn't look like to be this like wide panacea. And I bet it'll probably end up just being highly targeted treatment in certain scenarios. It would be my guess when, if they, you know, progress these, uh, these studies out. 
Yeah, and so this would be as good a time as any to remind the audience. A lot of people come up to me. They say, Eric, you seem like an oncologist. You seem like a neurologist. Fun fact, I'm actually neither, uh, and, <laughs> and neither is Greg. And Michael, are you either of those things? I am certainly not. Okay, so if you're listening, um, take it with a grain of salt. Talk to your doctor. Don't stop your cancer treatments because you heard Michael Hall say that uh, there was like three uh, low-quality studies out there indicating some promise. So yeah, please um, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Also, if you have any hate mail pertaining to keto, we're going to put Michael's email address in the description of this episode so you can send all that to him. I'm just going to have to talk to my HR about that, see how this goes. If HR is Carolyn, she will 100% sign off on that. <laughs> uh, HR is Carolyn, and she would sign off on that. That's why we like her. That's right. <laughs> She's all right. So um, something that's been... Uh, seen a lot of buzz about this on the internet lately ketone supplements uh, uh yes and i know you guys talk, uh, touched on it in the the keto guide so uh ketone supplements are, are there any applications for these um so if i were um if somebody came up to me and asked me like should i take ketone supplements for anything i would probably tell them to look at other more well-studied supplements first this like ketone supplements on the whole for me kind of fit into this like well maybe but like you just need to wait until there's more studies or they're able to figure out if there's a specific area where they might be actually applicable um in terms of a supplement research they're pretty much in their uh infancy especially when it pertains to uh, exercise performance um there's a lot more research that could be done um uh so like for now, it's just a big shoulder shrug, right? Like I probably, you know, being cautious, I would probably say, you know, you probably want to go with the more well-studied supplements first for whatever health endpoint you're looking at um, and maybe come to these uh, if you're willing to do like a little bit of experimentation. But on the whole, really, um, at least for uh, uh, performance benefits, um, it's kind of a, a crapshoot at this point uh, with most of the research indicating, um, at least pointing to, not having a uh, substantial effect or a positive effect at all. Um, but again, you have to take that with a grain of salt until more, uh, more research comes out. And as little research as there is in the performance um, arena, there's even less in other health endpoints. So there has been, you know, studies looking at exogenous ketones for like epilepsy, like another one for migraines. Um, but that research is, is fewer and further between than even the uh, performance sector. So y'all just going to have to wait. Now, this is surely going to be uh, specula speculative on your end, but w would you guess that your answer might fluctuate a little bit for someone who is on a traditional diet versus someone who's been on a keto, a keto diet for a while and, and, you know, keto adapted for whatever operational definition we have there? W would you say that the supplements might have more application for one group than the other i mean like possibly but that's yeah that would be highly speculative at this point um yeah i mean it, it might um but yeah i couldn't uh that would be for the uh the ultra experimenters if they were really wanting to go out onto a limb and kind of uh some try some some stuff out if they were already keto adapted yeah i mean there aren't uh other than uh, gastrointestinal upset and a little bit of nausea. Those two are the, the main uh, side effects of uh, taking too many uh, ketones too quickly. So if they're, you know, okay with those side effects and they, and they want to try them out, sure. Um, just as a, you know, as a personal end of one experiment to see if, you know, hey, does this actually uh, seem to do anything for me, like given my, you know, circumstances. Yeah, to be totally candid, the premise of my question was, I'm just trying really hard to figure out why a non-keto adapted person would supplement with ketones. I mean, they, they don't taste good <laughs> either. So, I mean, um, there was, uh, uh, there was one study that actually, um, had, you know, had gone through and reported the, the side effects of what people were experiencing. And so if you're, if you're one to, um, that wants to endure the, you know, bad, generally bad taste, maybe some nausea, maybe, maybe some like stomach upset and that's, you know, worth the cost benefit for you, then go for it. But yeah, we lay it all out for you if, uh, if you're so inclined to do so. Yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like the taste thing is probably easy to overlook if you've never tried them before, but it's basically like if someone's had keto breath, 
or you know you'd know what your morning breath tastes like it's like how do you feel about drinking that oh no that's horrible <laughs> uh. i mean they, they flavor it to like mask it a little bit but that is yeah. the, that is the yeah. ultimate taste that they're trying to cover up and like it it's probably it's still there yeah, they're 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 keeping uh, uh some food scientists in business trying to figure out how to mask the flavor of exogenous <laughs> ketones. So keto's been on the block for a while. I, I remember probably around twenty fourteen, there were a ton of people talking about keto all over the place. But now there's there's a new kid on the block, and I'm talking carnivore diet. Do you expect that a lot of people who are really into the carnivore diet um have is there some kind of intermingling between the keto world and the carnivore world? It's kind of been interesting to see these like trends um, that have happened over the past, like I would say like past 20 years or so, because it seems the progression has been um, like low carb kind of came on the block again. And then it was paleo got hot for a while and then died down. And then keto got hot for a while Um I think it probably has just hit its peak at the end of 2018, just purely going off of uh, Google Trends search results. Um, <clears throat> uh, keto diet was the most Google diet last year by a huge margin. Whoa. Like at the end of the year, yeah, like the end of 2018, um, the keto diet had something like 72% more uh, search traffic than the number two diet on that list, which was the Mediterranean diet. Holy shit. So I think we've probably hit peak keto and it might start to die off um, uh, over this next year. And I'm sure something else will take place. Maybe it's the carnivore diet. But it just seems that at least in this like um, diet popularity cycle, it's been a push to ever extreme um, diets in the low carb uh, on the low carb spectrum. Um, so I don't know how popular a carnivore diet might actually get just because as difficult as a keto diet you know seems to like me or to, or to most people to try to maintain like a carnivore diet seems like just a huge step up from that um in terms of effort and um just the restrictive nature of it which i think uh, is something that like i certainly struggled with when i was doing a ketogenic diet i fully binged after i went off on my keto diet i think i blacked out and ate entire cake um but uh yeah, I don't, I don't know where that's headed. It's been interesting to watch it develop uh, online a little bit. Um, I suspect it might kind of just be a small, fierce, vocal um, proponent to kind of keep it in the you know the nutrition space consciousness. But I have not seen it break out too much outside of my nutrition circles. You know, I've asked a few random friends if they've ever heard of this, and then nobody has. But everybody, all of them, have heard of the ketogenic diet. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the next year or so. The thing I think I'm most excited about as the carnivore diet gets more popular, I remember when keto started getting popular and people would start making recipes and be like, this is my keto-friendly cupcake recipe. Yeah. I'm interested mm -hmm. to see what the carnivores are going to do in that realm. The carnivore diet desserts. I'm waiting with bated breath. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for like a barbecue chicken cupcake. Like I'll try it out. Yeah. I, surely someone's going to get into that realm. I just don't know how or when. But Yeah. I haven't, actually, I haven't seen that either. That'd be, I, I would be very interested to see what actually comes out of that. There's some metaphorical meat on the bone there. If, if you're uh, an adventurous <laughs> chef out there, put together a carnivore dessert. Put out a cookbook. See what you get. How strict is carnivore? Because I'm wondering where like where sweetness would come from. Mm. I guess it just doesn't. Or are they like you know like the eighty percent carnivores? Like you might be like eighty percent keto, twenty percent you know flexible kind of thing. I, I mean, if you've if you've tried various organ meats, uh, oh, I have. Thymus is like slightly sweet, so it's like oh, just you know. Take, get some freeze dried thymus and sprinkle it on a steak. <laughs> it's basically a brownie. Like I, I don't know. Like I, I don't even know how you would start making carnivore desserts. It's just, it's just, just an idea that I'm putting out there for free. Someone can take that <laughs> and run with it. I just, I, I, mean, I have had some keto desserts that that actually were like quite good, and I've had some others that went the other direction too. I, uh, I know glycine has a very like mildly sweet taste too. So maybe they could, you know. You know, mix their mix glycine with some water, or I don't know, sprinkle it on something. Who's to say? But I know 
Greg and I nearly got into a fist fight over the idea of including cottage cheese and lasagna. So God knows how he would react to uh, <laughs> to any of these culinary abominations that might be forthcoming. Who ended up winning that competition, by the way? The lasagna off you guys had? I won. It was I was the one that made lasagna. I won by default. Eric's version of lasagna <laughs> was unseasoned shredded chicken breast, like marinara sauce out of a jar and cottage cheese. That was it. I'm I'm I am here for the simplicity of that lasagna. But it wasn't a lasagna though. Well, first of all, now you've exposed yourself as a dishonest charlatan <laughs> because there were there were seasonings. So for you to say that it was unseasoned chicken immediately removes you from the competition. What, what were the seasonings? I didn't taste any. I had was, was it like was it like one teaspoon of salt for like forty seven chicken breasts? Dude, you wouldn't know <laughs> what goes into the subtlety of seasoning a dish, okay? Your idea of flavor is just to take the nuclear option. I just very had a very subtle little pinch of Italian seasoning, a little bit of chicken broth uh, when I was cooking the chicken, and they really came together. And I think a lot of people had a really delightful time uh, <laughs> eating that lasagna. You are, you are literally like the meme of white parents on Thanksgiving <laughs> when it comes to seasoning food. Like th those memes that are every year, it's like when you have white parents and they bring out the special seasoning for the turkey and it's just like a glass of water. That's <laughs> the, that that is that is your approach to seasoning, Eric. You're speaking to my childhood here. Oh, I mean, it was my childhood, too. I can't I can't hate. Yeah. OK, before Greg continues this conversation, now that's delving into race, apparently, <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me stop us while we're ahead. Um, bottom line here, you've got this long, detailed, uh, really informative keto guide. I, I really do recommend that people check it out. We, we've just barely kind of grazed the surface in this conversation today. But bottom line, who is keto good for? So I'm going to punt a little bit on that and kind of bring up a couple of factors that people might want to run through themselves to see if it's a good fit for them. Um, so it would be preference, organization, support, and environment. So before you decide to like dive into this, um, just take stock of like what are the foods that you like to eat? Like what does your diet currently look like? Um, do you think you might be able to maintain a more sustainable diet by just tweaking what you have already been doing? Or is this drastic shift going to be something that kind of launches you into a, a better like eating habit overall? Um, you should consider the organization that's going to go into this because you don't just fall into a keto diet it takes a lot of um, diet appropriate meals and snacks and planning so like if you're somebody who enjoys doing that or doesn't mind doing that then yeah this could potentially be a fit for you um, if you're somebody who struggles with that or likes to eat out a lot um, that might be uh, something to consider before jumping into this your support system and your environment also matter like are your friends and family on board do you have uh, groups that you can go to on facebook or twitter or elsewhere that can you can get answers from or support from um, you have to consider the changes you have to make to your home environment you know, you know consider removing disallowed foods from your place this might get tricky if you live with people who are not on a keto diet or with roommates who aren't really into like supporting that uh that uh, type of eating habit who leave, you know, like ho-hos around there to try to sabotage your keto diet, you know? So um, these would probably be the four things uh, I would uh, recommend somebody run through um, before they kind of launch into this uh, pretty drastic lifestyle shift. Because it's not just changing your uh, the food that you're eating. It's really going to touch on um, other aspects of the way that you live your life to eating out um, to the way that you socialize. So just be... Um, just go into it fully informed about what this is actually going to look like um, and don't uh, don't take it uh, too lightly especially if, if you have medical conditions like, you know go talk to your doctor about this let them know what you're doing like get them on board with that and then uh, make sure you're getting the adequate uh, uh, medical tests that you might need for your for your health circumstances well that's a very nuanced answer that uh, hard to get upset about so uh really appreciate you coming by and sharing some of this knowledge with us about keto. Like I said, the, the guide you guys have put together is really terrific. Um, if people want to stay in touch with you and, and kind of stay up to date with your work, where can they find you? 
I'm actually most active on Twitter. I like to follow a lot of the science Twitter communities uh, out there. Um, so you can just find me. Um, my handle is at I know nutrition. So Twitter, uh, you're not doing the Instagram thing? No, I have like four photos up there and it's been two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. People are, are very mean on Twitter. People aren't as mean to me on Instagram. I mute a lot because <laughs> I'm just I'm just here I'm just here for like scientists sharing what they're doing in their labs and like I'm just here for like interesting science articles. Um, so I don't engage much. I'm pretty quiet. Um, so, uh, but you can find me on there if uh, if people want to try to reach out. Yeah, Twitter's good for that. They can also find you at examine.com, right? Oh, of course. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming by. We really really uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.